Hello. I don't hear anybody. <laughs> Mike, check. Can you guys hear us on the call remotely? Okay. Thumbs up. Yes. Thanks, Jason. Don't unmute. I already did. Get out of here. Jen, I have no volume. I can hear you. Oh, never mind. Can you hear us? Okay. All right, I'm calling this meeting of the Newington Board of Education to order. Today is Wednesday, April the 6th, 2022. The time now is 7.02 p.m. And if you're able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. You can be seated. I'm going to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Michael Branda. Here. Danielle Grove. Here. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Present. Beth Menke Hutt Magna. Here. Richard LaVarriere. Present. Amy Parati. Here. Sam Sharma. Here. Jessica Weaver. Here. Anastasia Yap. Here. Everyone is present. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to move on to agenda item B, which is the presentation of awards and proclamations. And tonight I'm going to be reading a resolution honoring the Newington professional secretaries. Are any of the secretaries here? I know Sophie's online. Deb Craig? Deb Craig is here. <laughs> Okay. All right. Whereas Wednesday, April 6, 2022, has been proclaimed as Newington Professional Secretaries Day, and whereas the Newington Public School Secretaries are qualified and dedicated professionals who relate positively to students, staff, and parents, and whereas the Newington Public School Secretaries perform secretarial work of a complex, confidential, and responsible nature. And whereas the Newington Public School Secretaries set the tone for the school by their pleasant and courteous manner and prompt attention to questions and requests, and whereas the Newington Public School Secretaries contribute to the success of the entire school system and are always willing to go above and beyond their assigned duties whenever necessary. Therefore, we do hereby proclaim 
Wednesday, April 6, 2022, as Newington Professional Secretaries Day. Be it resolved that we urge all of the citizens of our community to join with us in actively expressing gratitude to the Newington Secretaries on this very special day. Be it further resolved that the Secretary of the Newington Board of Education is directed to spread this resolution upon the minutes of this meeting and to provide a suitable copy for presentation. Thank you very much. And I believe we can give him a hand. Yes, yeah, so we have accepting tonight would be Anne Marie Sunderland from Newington High School, Debbie Craig from Central Office, and Sophie Pachoki from Central Office. If you want to stay around line, I believe. She can come. You get to do it because you're here. Oh, you're fine. You don't need to say anything. On behalf of the board, I want to present this to you. Thank you very much. Oh, no, I was just going to say thank you very much on behalf of all the secretaries. Okay. All right. Thank you. thank you. Any of them online wish to speak? I just wanted to say thank you for this honor tonight. We really appreciate it. Very good. And thank you. Sophie, do you want to speak? You're, you're muted, Sophie. I don't know if you can hear me. We can now. Wonderful. Um, big shout out to all our school secretaries. They do an amazing job running the building, but uh, really uh, focusing on the students and all their support to the staff, the families. Um, they are the best, and thank you to the Board of Education for this recognition. Very good. All right, I'll open it up for board comments. Ms. Weaver. Just wanna say a big thank you. Are we, are we filming that way? I don't know where to look. Okay, well, I just wanna say thank you so much. Um, Deb, you are a rock star, Sophie, you're a rock star, and Anne-Marie, thank you so much for what you do at the high school. Literally cannot function without you. Um, we're just really appreciative of everything that you do every single day, um, because I don't think this board would function without you all. So uh, not only do the students, <laughs> I know our students are grateful, but we as a board are grateful, so thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Branda. I think it goes without saying that our school secretaries are the backbone of each school that we have. And in the resolution that Dr. Fletcher was reading, that the line that stood out to me was, and are always willing to go above and beyond their assigned duties whenever necessary. And I think that that sums up the work that all of you do very well. And I thank you for it. What's that, Wagner? Uh, thank you, ditto to um, what the other uh, board members have said, but I also wanted to say to you, um, uh, having gone into the schools a few times, they are often the first face that um, one sees when entering. And um, I have always, and other parents and, and teachers and, and whomever have always really said that they are greeted with just such kindness and warmth, which really um, helps build such a warm and, and nurturing community in the school. Um, so thank you so much for that. And the three amazing ladies that, that work at Central Office that um, really make the gears turn. Thank you for all that you do. You're so very appreciated. Thank you. Anyone else? I wanna say that there, there's more that they do than just taking care of all of the secretarial stuff. You need to be aware that especially in the elementary level, they are the first eyes on the doors of anybody that's coming into the building. So in a sense, they hold a very important security position as well. So they carry a lot of responsibility. I know that my times of working in the buildings, uh, I've always enjoyed working with them. They've always been very pleasant. They know what's going on and they know how to get it done and they're no nonsense. Okay, so thank you all very much for everything that you do. Sam's on, oh, there, I see the hands now. Okay, all right, so Sam Sharma, you're up next. I just wanna quickly thank all the secretaries because um, thank, you for, thank you for what you do and we couldn't really do what we do without your support. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. 
All right, and thank you. And we have our student rep on tonight, Vidisha. Please go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to also thank all the secretaries. I know that at the high school, they're always such a positive light. And I know Ms. Sunderland's on the line, and I know how much she does for Ms. Tigno, for the students. And as a SUCO member, we know how many events and stuff that we send to Ms. Tigno that Ms. Sunderland takes care of. So we all really appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Yop. Sorry about that. <laughs> I want to say thank you, Anne-Marie, um, Debbie, Sophie, thank you um, to all the Newington secretaries. We're grateful that we have you here. Your hard work does not go unnoticed. Um, and thank you for all you do. All right, thank you. And Dr. Brummett? Uh, I echo what everyone else has said. And, and Sophie and I joke that she's like a wedding planner for the board of ed because anytime there's an event, she's got to coordinate it almost. It, it, all these events are just a huge undertaking. And I know, as mentioned already, Anne Marie Sunderland at the high school has similar responsibilities, but district wide, you never are not greeted with a smile. How can I help you? And their safety and security and their just their TLC is, is what our children need. And I'm thrilled to that we are honoring them this evening. So thank you. All right, and thank you. All right, if there are no further comments, I am going to move on to the next agenda item, which is agenda item C. <clears throat> that is our public participation on any matter related to board responsibilities. Uh, you can call in in person via telephone. The number is 860-665-8659. And we do limit civil participation to three minutes. So uh, it looks like we have one online. It's uh, Miss Dana Havens. So go ahead, Dana. Hi, Dana Havens, Stoddard Avenue. Um, I'm assuming that this evening you're gonna be going over the rest of the budget book since you didn't really finish going over it a couple of weeks ago when I was listening. And um, I know you have to be getting your budget in soon. So I'm assuming this is kind of it. Um, but I just had a few observations and questions I wanted to share. Uh, my first observation is that for the first time in 13 years or so, since I've been following the Board of Ed meeting, there was next to no public participation during the public hearing last night regarding the budget, nor was there any chatter on Facebook other than the usual BOE members or friends and families. And only like two people spoke up at the meeting um, last night, demanding that the SOS's proposed budget be funded as presented. So I hope that you guys keep that in mind along with our children as you decide how to fund or reduce certain line items. Also, I can't believe I didn't realize this until now, but that our BOE doesn't get access to the balances or cash on hand or credits or whatever the correct terminology is. And I'm not referring to grant monies that MPS, um, uh, but I'm talking about like the money that MPS has stashed away. Um, this is disturbing to me and I can't imagine how one can approve a budget not knowing the full financial story, especially since as an example, it took a member of the public to remind you all that the credit of a credit balance in the Chromebook insurance account or the fact that you no longer print out handbooks. So that causes me to wonder what happened to the sizable amount that had been stashed away and it was available when the last SOS wanted to purchase St. Mary's or the property on, on Payne Road for a bus garage or the fact that there was money available to twice fix the high school roof and twice the town stepped in and paid for it. So I'm guessing there's maybe some funds in there we're not really aware of. So keeping these things in mind, when Lou says they're building in a cushion for a possible increase in students, like the extra 100K or so for the special transportation, do we really need in this economic climate to pad our budget so thickly, especially not knowing what our true account balances are? I also would like some clarification on the staff hired with the ESSER funds. Um, were these staff hired on knowing it was temporary? I'm assuming they are since that was a one time, hopefully grant given as a result of a pandemic. Hopefully we don't have another one um, or have they been hired on permanently and which then will be increasing our future staffing and retirement obligations. And I hope that was under the minutes. Thank you. All right, and thank you. Is there anyone in the room that wishes to participate? Yep. 
you can come at this time, come to the table. Hi, my name is Jonas Roberts. I live on Fister Drive in Newington. I'm a third grade teacher at Anna Reynolds and I'm a father of four children. Uh, a few months from now, uh, three of my four children will have graduated uh, from Newington High School. I'll have one who will be a junior next year, who's a sophomore now. Um, my children have received a phenomenal education from Newington Public Schools. And uh, I know my tax dollars and several, you know, all of the community's tax dollars have provided that for my children. So um, even though my children are done, you know, their journey is done with uh, Newington Public Schools. You know, I'm here to make sure that, you know, the next generation of students get that same high quality of education, if not better. And so I'm here to kind of ask and fight, ask the board to fight to fund as much of the education budget as possible. Um, when a budget is not fully funded, our students do suffer. Current budget does not plan for hiring a new library media specialist to fill a position that is open due to a retirement. The plan is to shift the schedules of the four elementary media specialists to cover the vacancy at the middle school. I strongly urge those involved in the budget process to rethink this proposal. The role of a library media specialist is so much more than checking out books, and it's my fear that that is the perception of that position. For almost two years during the pandemic, students were not allowed to check out books, and during those two years, the media specialists taught first on carts and then in the media classroom, in the media center. Uh, they are specialists, it's right there in their title. Um, they're experts in their field. They're an important part, an important ally to classroom teachers in many ways. Um, first, library media specialists play a key role in meeting our district's vision and mission. They research and purchase books that represent and affirm the identities of students and families we serve. These books are spotlighted around the media center where students can see themselves when they enter. Media specialists read aloud books and discuss uh, those books with the children that work towards our district goals of social and emotional learning and cultural responsive teaching. Media specialists are on the front line of this work. Losing a full-time media specialist would set us back and hinder the social and emotional growth of our students. Library media specialists put books in the hands of students that may not have ever discovered the book without their guidance. Library media specialists inspire the next generation of readers. They are partners with classroom teachers and a vital part of literacy instruction. Media specialists teach the mind work or the comprehension of reading through discussions of character traits and life lessons. They also build background knowledge that increase students' understanding and ability to make connections to what we are teaching in the classroom. Um, they teach the heart work or the social and emotional component of reading by discussing empathy, compassion, and different perspectives in literature. Our library media specialist at Anna Reynolds works very closely with me um, to write our school family lessons that focus on social emotional learning. She is a member of our school-based social emotional learning committee as well. This committee drives the work that we do at our building level and she plays a vital role in our success. Media specialists wear many hats. They resolve technology problems for students and staff. They swap out damaged Chromebooks. They sign out loaners, Chromebooks, and technology are necessary in today's world for students uh, to be successful. When so much of what we plan is in the Google Classroom, we rely on students having Chromebooks that are ready to go. Media specialists um, help us with that endeavor. They teach lessons to the Google Classroom as well. They're an important ally in the work of teaching, researching, citation, ethical use of materials, being a good digital citizen, using technology responsibly. This is just another way our media specialists support our students and teachers. When a car has a bad spark plug, the engine will still run. The car will move forward, but you feel the difference. If you don't replace that spark plug, the car will eventually break down. We cannot continue to function as a school district by not replacing positions when people retire. I urge all those involved in the budget process to hire a new library media specialist for the middle school and allow the library media specialist at the elementary level to continue to be an ally and a leader in our district's efforts in the areas of literacy instruction, technology, social emotional learning, and cultural responsive teaching. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> next on the line, we have Shannon Sorensen. If there's somebody else in the room that's gonna to wanna to speak, uh, you can go ahead and take the seat right now and I'll call on you after. Hi there, my name is Shannon Sorensen. I live on Cypress Road. I am a parent to a fourth grader at Ruth Chafee and we'll have a kindergartner there this coming fall. 
I am speaking in support of our elementary level media specialists who are facing changes if a fourth full-time media specialist cannot be filled at the elementary level. Both my husband and I volunteered at Ruth Chafee's Media Center with Mrs. Riley for three years prior to COVID and virtual learning. We saw firsthand the impact the media program has on the students at all levels. We met Mrs. Riley at open house when our daughter was in kindergarten and she immediately began building a relationship with our family, showing us the programs and opportunities our kids would be able to look forward to enjoying through the media center for the next five years. Among these programs are virtual reality experiences where they get visual learning and they get excited to go to media each week. She plans and coordinates author visits every year where all students get to meet in person and hear children's authors share about their books and journeys to becoming writers. The most important program that faces being cut due to our media specialists not being present at their own schools full time is morning book exchange. In addition to their weekly media specials class at Ruth Chafee, all students have an opportunity every single morning to visit the media center and have one on one consults with Mrs. Riley to seek out new and exciting books to read. They can return books they finished and check out new books any day of the week. Just this past Monday morning before morning announcements, Mrs. Riley saw 45 students across all, grade, across all grade levels and sent each of them on their way with a new book to read that they were excited about. Over the course of the five years that our children are in elementary school, our media specialists are getting to know the students closely and are able to get to know and guide each student on a personal level, especially with connecting one-on-one -on -one during these morning meeting book exchanges. They are also able to work with the classroom teachers to help further encourage and guide each individual student to become avid readers by making recommendations based on what they show interest in reading. I have no doubt that it's thanks to her encouragement and ability to connect on this level that more kids are choosing to read when they go home instead of staring at screens. She's able to do this by being present every single morning in the media center. I'm happy to know my daughter's heading to middle school next year, not just as a strong reader, but an enthusiastic reader who's been taught to think, communicate, and seek out ways to keep learning and exploring through books. The decisions being made to stretch our educators even more thin is incredibly disappointing because it is really about what is being taken away from our kids and the impact that will have on them through the years at Newington Public Schools. This week is National Library Week, and I encourage you to think and fully understand the impact and important role our, our elementary media educators play in forming the foundation and enthusiasm for learning in our children's first years of school. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm Valerie Wicke, Michael Lane. Um, I'm here today to voice my disappointment with the recent decision to eliminate a library science position at the elementary level. I volunteer daily at the Anna Reynolds Media Center. I've been lucky so far to be able to see firsthand what an amazing media program we have and all the care and hard work our media teacher, Mrs. Alves, puts in. While I get to ch help check in and shelve books, I also get to see her teach the children of Anna Reynolds. What I see is someone who loves her job and has a great relationship with our children. I see someone who has taken the time to get to know each of our kids and helps them discover their perfect book. I see someone who doesn't just read to our children, but provides background knowledge about what they are reading. I see someone who works with the literacy committee to organize fun activities for the students, such as the Bottle Buddy Project. My son is in fourth grade, and since he started school, we have heard about how important it is for Newington Public Schools to foster a love of reading. I agree that that's very important. These programs are vital if we want to make that a goal for all students. For some students, the only way they get access to a wide variety of books is through the media center. I believe for us to have a thriving media program, we must have a dedicated media specialist at each school. Having media teachers rotate schools will not allow them to give the time they currently do at each school. I urge you to reconsider this, um, and thank you. All right, thank you. And online next, we have Dr. Forrest Healthy. Hi, uh, this is Forrest Healthy, 282 Lamplighter Lane. Um, I I don't have the same <laughs> defense, I think, of our of our wonderful you know library and media specialist staff that that you've already heard from. So I I won't go into that. 
Uh, you know, I, I think the thing that presses on my mind the most right now, uh, and while I wasn't able to attend the town council meeting due to another conflict last night, I know that all of you plus the town council and everybody else got a, a letter from me uh, to go into the minutes to that effect. Um, I'm glad to hear at least there's some kind of discussion about not flat funding your budget, which is incredibly disturbing because I know then that we'd be concerned with not just our library staff, but other classroom and related services staff potentially being looked at. So I would just ask, I guess, um, you know, in, in light of the memorandum that was discussed, I'm not sure if that's getting discussed tonight or not, or whether to sign it, um, but whatever you're able to do from your side of the table to make sure that we have as minimal impact on our students as possible through maintaining as many of our staff from all sectors of our schools. Um, because again, as we've heard tonight, just the, the impact that they have. And you know, I, the, the example of the spark plug going, you know, we can certainly see that in, the, in our past. We, we had social workers who were spread out over multiple buildings, but a commitment was made to ensure that you know, every building had one. And, and we saw that positive impact on our student body. And, and that paid off dividends then when we had a pandemic where our social workers and, and our related service staff were getting leaned on, especially so. Um, you know, I'm looking at this from a higher education perspective and seeing the impact on reading that we are seeing from students coming out of the K-12 um, pipeline and making sure that we have those staff who can support that is gonna be essential. Uh, so I understand that right now that, you know, you are doing what you can uh, with as much as you have to work with. The memorandum may be one way to help bridge that gap to keep as many of our staff going. Um, but hopefully you can continue the conversations beyond just having this memorandum approved so that your budget is at least covered so that you don't get take a cut and maybe see if there's additional ways to try to fill that line as well. So I know it's it's a tall order to, to take, but you know I, I appreciate all of your efforts to try to affect that outcome. Thank you and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Jen Rodriguez, Northwood Road. Good evening, the last time I was here, I had a water feature in my classroom. Uh, last time I was in person. Um, two years ago, just before the pandemic. I'd like to first thank you all for supporting the students, families, and staff of um, our town of Newington, especially Dr. Fletcher and working with Dr. Brummett in a bipartisan manner, putting people before politics. I come to you this evening as a concerned voter, parent, and educator. In the 13 odd years I've been a part of NPS, many things have changed. And just to be clear, I'm a first grade teacher at Anna Reynolds School. I've seen curriculum updates come and go, We've seen teaching strategies come in and out of fashion. We've traded books for iPads, then Chromebooks, whiteboards for smart boards. We're flexible, we roll with the punches. Ultimately, these are all things, just things, replaceable things. The pandemic taught us much, but none more than our connection to people, students and teachers are irreplaceable. The effect it has on learning is undeniable. Educators are not obsolete. Tragically, due to the budgetary restraints placed on our school district, a position is not being filled. A connection is being lost. Relationships are being fractured and the effect on learning will be felt. When you close your eyes and you think of a media specialist, likely you're thinking of a librarian, but they aren't. Our media specialists host a number of duties and responsibilities that others have already spoken of here this evening. Their expertise, years of education, experience are irreplaceable. They aren't checking books in and out. They're fostering a love of reading, teaching literacy skills, research skills, and more. Our district is a champion of the co-teaching model and has encouraged us to utilize this model. But the funny thing is we have for ages. Our media specialists are the closest thing to exemplifying that co-teaching model. They look at our classroom curriculum and support it. They collaborate with classroom teachers. They build background knowledge for students. They foster equity and diversity through finding and sharing literature that students can see themselves in. They support the technology needs of our students and staff. They bring fresh ideas to numerous committees, committees that foster learning and literacy. They help us to bridge the pandemic gap that we are working through. And in the absence of the gifted and talented program of years past, they provide students with enrichment opportunities outside of the classroom. Now, the three remaining media specialists will have to break their time up amongst many buildings. They will now have to take on the responsibilities of the unfulfilled position, effectively taking on an additional third of work and responsibility while fracturing the relationships they've built with students and staff. I worry that we are leaning toward a model of phasing out these amazing educators and co-teachers. 
They aren't things. They and their skill set are irreplaceable. The effect on learning will be felt. A hard and difficult decision was made due to these budgetary constraints. We love them and we appreciate them and hope another solution can be found. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. <clears throat> there is no more online. Do we have anyone else in the room that wishes? Can be any matter related to the board responsibilities. There will be another opportunity at the end of the meeting for public to participate. As we move on, it will be the board deliberating. So, yep, that's good. This is the time now to participate. All right, hello. Um, my name is Nicole Daigle. I live on Main Street. Um, I am the media specialist at Martin Kellogg Middle School um, and have been for 17 years. I'm the program leader for the K-12 media department and mother of two children in the Newington school system, both who go to Martin Kellogg. Um, I really don't have a lot to add to the very eloquent things that other people have said. Um, I just want to mention um, what, how cost effective librarians are. And having one full-time libra librarian in each building um, basically means that that program thrives and benefits every single student and teacher every day. And for, for the cost of one librarian and saving that cost by not filling a position will not have a huge positive impact on the budget, but it will have a tremendously negative impact on the schools, on the teachers, and especially on the children. So that's what I wanted to say. If we're just, if we're thinking dollars and cents, um, we lose so much more than we gain. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more public participation. So at this time, I am going to move on to agenda item D, our standing committee information items. There is one that we're gonna get a brief report from, uh, Ms. Hutt Wagner. Okay, good evening. Just a little report from um, the curriculum committee that met earlier um, this evening. We got a update on student achievement um, and we just kind of compared numbers from January to March and all of our students um, are, are succeeding in getting close to meeting that 80% benchmark, um, which the K through four math and five through eight reading students did meet and our K through four reading students are almost there, which is fantastic. Um, we also looked at adopting some textbooks, um, two of which are textbooks for our um, ECE UConn classes. Um, and then we talked about um, a really interesting and thought provoking topic, which is making sure that we have financial literacy classes and just financial literacy in general being presented to our high school students. Um, so we looked at two of the classes that are currently offered to our 10th, 11th and 12th graders and um, continuing to look at the addition of perhaps a consumer math class um, to make sure that as many students as possible have the opportunity um, to, to take a class of this nature and to really um, have this, this financial um, literacy moving forward and, and putting them on the, the road to their future. Um, so that is what we have for now and um, stay tuned for additional conversations. Additionally, I have a lot of notes. Um, we did talk about the Desmos math program, which is currently being piloted um, in the eighth grade. Um, and it is a free program, but there is also a paid subscription. Um, so we were just kind of presented with, with some data looking at that program. Um, and a request was made to kind of look at some numerical data on the effect that this math program is having on our students and their scores and kind of tracking, um, you know, the, the effect of that program with our kids. So um, more updates to come and, and that's where we stand. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the board? Oops. 
Go ahead, Ms. Strauss. I, I, I guess I have a question. I listened into a little bit of the curriculum meeting, but I, I won't lie. I was um, dealing with my family at the time. So um, the Desmos piece, you know, I, I just, from what I was gathering is they were still trying to ask us for, to, to fund it. And I guess the question is probably more to you. And I don't know if this is the time. Like, I mean, I thought we, just tell me this isn't the time and we can talk about it later. Cause you know where I'm going with it. I do, and I can actually answer your question okay, because that was a question posed. I guess I should ask my question. This. My question is, is like, yes. can this even be funded at this point because the budget has kind of already been pushed forward and that's been cut? So this was brought, is it appropriate for me to answer this? Right. Okay. Um, so this, uh, this was brought up and um, the answer was that this is a program that there might perhaps be funds to purchase it as a buy ahead. Um, but there's no concrete plan to buy it at this moment. We were just kind of being presented with an overview of what the program is. If anybody can correct or add to, please do that. This is Krauss. I don't need to correct, but I'll just add on. Um, we, John Bruno, an eighth grade teacher who is involved in the pilot, came to the meeting to share the difference because... Um, at the prospect of not having it for next year, he wanted to share information with the board about the difference between the free and the paid version, because that was one of the things that went back is use the free version, and they're very different. Um, so he wanted to share what the difference was and the traction that he sees he's getting with his eighth grade students as a result of it, so that if there were funds available, it could still be a consideration to purchase and that there wouldn't be a surprise. So that was one of the reasons he came forward to share. There was a request to share some of the data around that, which I'll bring to the next meeting. Um, we didn't have unit assessment data there at the at the meeting today, but he did share anecdotally what he's seeing and the difference in his students. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. And just to add on to that, I think was helpful was, um, it was asked if like, oh, West Hartford was being used or what was it? And they weren't, um, but it was said that a couple, I, <laughs> but in a, a couple of ours, uh, particularly in our DERG are using it, including Rocky Hill, Naugatuck, Tolland, um, East Lyme, and a couple other ones he had mentioned, I think maybe a few others. So um, in terms of how, one of the things I like to use, um, I think is a helpful tool or aspect in our decision-making process is just who else is using the paid version versus not. And so he said a couple others in our DERG where I don't, know if he had the complete list or not, but um, just to give reference to who uses it in our DERG or not as a paid version. Go ahead, Ms. Rose. So, Wendy, I would be curious also um, if we could get data from Mr. Bruno, who I have high regards. Yes. It's an amazing yes. human being. Um, how the kids feel about it, right? And then also how much time are kids spending staring at their screen in class? Like, because that's just a concern for me about the Desmos program. So I would like that data it would be interesting for me. Thank you. Well, Ms. Yop, you had your hand up and now it's down. Did you want to ask a question? <clears throat> yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, my question, and I was part of the meeting, but I forgot this part. Um, you said we were looking to, you know, possibly, how are we going to, how are we going to pay for it? I couldn't remember if they said, you know, if, was it based on a credit we may receive or? I, I couldn't remember how they said we could pay for this program if we chose to go forward. I think that was for Beth. Sorry. Sure. I mean, as the year rolls along, we've had a budget freeze. And once we start getting closer to the end of the school year, we can look at what funds are available. Now, later in tonight's meeting, I'll talk about um, some money that we have to allocate using those funds. But that is one of the things we look at when things get cut out of the budget. Is there any potential for a buy ahead opportunity? So we can't answer that tonight. It would really depend on how things boil down right before June 30th when we have to balance the books. So that is kind of the short answer to a very in depth question. Thank you. Right, thank you, right, Ms. Droz. For one of the two of you, I just oh, it, it, you watched me. I saw you. Okay, you saw me. All right. So my question is to one of the two of you, and I don't care. Like my understanding is, as a board, we approve a budget, and then let's say we approve a budget for a hundred dollars. 
That's not what we're approving the budget for. But let's say we do. And then after that, the board of the 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 you people, not you people, <laughs> get to really kind of decide how to allocate it any way you you deem fit in the best interest of our students. So, right. So the the conversation around like is decimals something you want to buy ahead really isn't our, under our purview. That's under your purview. And because you're not really asking us for money, you're just reallocating money however you deem fit. Right? Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, I would say by virtue of the fact that it made it to the budget presentation originally, that's an endorsement on my part and my team's part. So that was our first attempt at getting Desmos. Now, we all know we went into the budget season being told we we're going to get a 0% increase and the board struggled mightily to try to cut the budget as lean as possible. They were very uh, invested in not having staff reductions of current staff. So when we got down to the, you know, the bitter end of things, we had to cut repair items. We had to cut curricular items. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk later about what happened after that. The budget on the board side is done. The budget was transmitted to the town weeks ago. Um, our, our, our process now is to hear back from the town about what will be the final number. And I'll be obviously explaining that in a later agenda item, but we have vetted our budget and submitted it to the town as a board quite some time ago. Go ahead. I, I, maybe I didn't ask it right. <laughs> I, I, your, your answer was delightful and very informative. Um, so my question is, is like, we're talking about really last year's budget, right? With the yes. decimals, the budget that we're not even talking about tonight. It is not up to us. That's your money to do with it, how you deem fit, right? Or feel fit or whatever the expression is. Yes, once we are allocated a budget from the town, then we have jurisdiction to spend it. Now we can't go crazy. We can't go off the deep end and go on a trip somewhere, but we have, as long as we're spending within the parameters of what the line items are, we have some latitude to make transfers. The, the board is apprised of that, but yes, once the money's allocated to the board, we are allowed to spend it with, within appropriate boundaries. And that is absolutely the correct. It's a state statute. That was a good answer. That was a better answer. That's a better question. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Mr. Leverrier. So, and oh, thanks. So we're still on the uh, curriculum committee, right? Yes, correct. Okay. So, um, with regard to um, that, the financial literacy um, topic, are we going to be continuing to explore um, a possible requirement? And like specifically, when I was listening in uh, as a public member, um, I was thinking that maybe possibly blending of the courses because there was the issues with students who may have difficulty with math, et cetera. Um, I was just wanted to make sure we were going to continue to explore that possibility. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, um, we were so excited talking about it that all of a sudden it was seven o'clock. <laughs> um, but, but my, um, my hope and goal, and I, I know from Wendy's nods and just because she's wonderful that we are, absolutely going to continue this conversation um, because it because it is something that is so incredibly important. Um, and so I think there are things to be ironed out and to be talked about. And I absolutely think the conversation should, per, just me personally as chair of that committee, should continue um, and kind of move on down the road so we can make some decisions and get some good things going. Thanks. All right. So we have a student rep, Jimmy Vendetti. Please go ahead. Oh, we have one more hand. I'll get you right after he's been his hand's been up for oh, a while. Sorry. Oh, uh, I, I'm sorry. Um, but she's been experiencing technical difficulties, and she wanted me to raise my hand for her. Um, so, but you should go ahead. <laughs> what Mr. Rose said about uh, getting some student input about this, because I personally know that at least at the high school for a lot of the math classes I've taken, Desmos is not something that we use as often as others may think. So I think it would be interesting to get student perspective on how necessary it is to get the um, premium version of it. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> And Ms. Weaver. Sorry, quickly. Um, and also just to note that Desmos was for six, seventh, eighth. So it wasn't for high school. I think that that's where we were focused on. Um, and then to, uh, for the financial literacy, um, just to point out, uh, one of the cool statistics we found out was that half 
uh, 54% of the senior class uh, has taken principles of finance or foundations of something. So one of our personal finance or financial literacy classes. Um, so I think obviously there's the demand there and everyone from last meeting knows how I feel uh, about this. So it's exciting. But I think um, obviously I would bug Beth to bring it up again, which I don't have to because she's great. Um, but yeah, it just uh, in terms of the interest, uh, it's already there. And um, Miss Dennis and Mrs. Miller are already um, kind of working through that with Kristen and Wendy. So great updates on, on that. And I think always more to come. Okay, thank you. Any other board members with questions or comments? Uh, just one other point of clarification. Um, one last week was that just last week we were here. Last week we talked about um, should it be a requirement for next year was the original proposal. And one of the things that Ms. Freeman brought forward is that to just make the the two courses we have required would require additional staffing because we only have a limited number of people who can teach that. Um, so what we were talking brainstorming is other ways to bring that in and the group came up with some suggestions. So Ms. Freeman and I will go back and explore some ideas around consumer math that are happening, bringing it into another department and bring that back to the table. So it might not be that we can go right to required for next year with the current staffing we have, but we wanna look at that as a, if that's a goal we're working towards, what could that look like over the course of the next year or so? Excellent, thank you. No further questions or comments. I am going to move on to item number six, which is our report from the student representatives, Vidisha and James. Don't fail me now. Sorry, the talk was loaded. Um, so yeah, I'll start the evening, I guess. Um, so for the music and performing arts department, uh, at the beginning of the, of the Names Can Really Hurt Us assembly, which was yesterday, Tuesday, the 5th of April, um, the Newington Chamber Choir sang Revolution to kick off the event for the juniors. Um, also, the chorale con or the concert for um, the chorale and chamber choir has officially been scheduled to May 24th, um, and the band concert has been officially been scheduled to May 12th, so both concerts in May. Uh, Amar Singh recently received the 2022 Outstanding Arts Award from Connecticut Association of Schools. So congratulations, Amar. And upperclassmen music students are taking end of the day open periods as an opportunity to volunteer with the middle school music departments because um, this was a specific thing that was spearheaded by Mr. Clark. Um, he found that this year especially, he saw a massive um, nosedive in the amount of people involved in the music department. So he wanted to... Um, he wanted to send some of the older students um, to the middle schools to say, hey, stick with it to uh, keep with the music department going into high school because it is a fun experience and it is, it's just it's a good thing to do. It's a good group, a group of kids and you know, it's fun. <laughs> um, as far as sports goes, <laughs> Outdoor Track um, had their first meeting last night or first meet last night, I apologize, um, Tuesday, the 5th of April. Unfortunately, they lost by a lot to Windsor. However, um, that said, multiple personal records were set um, and two students actually qualified for states. So good on those guys. Uh, girls tennis, they had their first match on Monday against Glastonbury. Lineup was different due to players being absent, but all the girls worked extremely hard and played well. Um, the boys tennis team had their first match today, uh, April 6th, um, indoors due to weather against Glastonbury. Lacrosse is scheduled to have their first game tomorrow um, against East Catholic, uh, and it's going to be a home game. It was originally going to be at East Catholic, but I think because of um, the weather and field concerns, they're having it now in Newington. Um, and uh, I believe that this, uh, as of right now, this information is subject to change. Um, softball, um, yay to them. They won their first game against Northwest Catholic on Monday, April 4th. Uh, baseball won their first game or first season game, I should say. They had a scrimmage before this, but their first their first season game yesterday um, against Farmington. Um, boys volley volleyball had um, their first scrimmage this weekend on Saturday, and their season games will start soon. Um, as far as upcoming slash past events uh, go, the largest one on the docket was the Kiara McDermott Basketball Classic. Um, the staff and the Newington police officers played against the students from different grades, and the student senior team was ultimately uh, victorious. However, it was requested that um, we point out that the sophomores came the closest to beating the seniors. Um, the game was 20 to 21. Also, um, 
as far as the three point competition for that event, um, our uh, New England zone, Lily Ferguson, set a new record of 15 three point shots. Um, so get Lily. Um, April 5th, uh, uh, we had um, the Names Can Really Hurt Us program for the juniors um, yesterday, which I was lucky enough to participate in. Um, we had the same event last month for the sophomores, and typically the assembly is only for sophomores in, you know, per year, but uh, the administration wanted to do this for the juniors too because um, the juniors this year missed it because of COVID. Um, so now we're getting back into the, the swing of things where it's going to be every year for the sophomores. Um, Boys for Change. A freshman uh, student, uh, Shrista Wadaya, Wadawa, sorry, encouraged the entire student body to participate in a petition that could help NHS to be considered for a grant for additional outdoor seating for outdoor learning, um, which Ms. Tigno has graciously pushed forward um, and has been publicizing it quite a bit um, to get students to participate and for possible extra grant funding. Um, uh, April 20th will be our next Wacky Wednesday, and the theme is Wacky Tacky Day, which I'm looking forward to. Um, this week, April 3rd through the 8th, is going to be uh, junior prom ticket sales, and senior prom ticket sales were pushed to um, in the week following break, um, those two block days, which are, are April 20th and April 21st. Senior prom tickets will be on sale in the library. Um, and the, just a reminder, both proms, um, the junior prom will be on May 6th, Senior prom will be on May 13th, um, both of which I believe are Fridays. Uh, and then on to Venetia. Uh, I apologize, my camera is off. It keeps quitting on me when I turn it on. Don't want to take any risks while I'm presenting. But, so for clubs, student council, we're finishing up our We Care project for World Central Kitchen. It was organized by Ms. Tigno and executed by student council. Student Council volunteers also cut out hundreds of colored paper petals to deliver to each room. And then students and faculties made a donation to World Central Kitchen. They decorated the petal and we put it up in the lunchroom. Uh, DECA, the national trips uh, is going to be in Atlanta this year from April 22nd to the 26th. Members of our DECA chapter will be attending this conference and also we additionally just elected our officers for the 2022-23 school year. So there can be a smooth transition. Our very own Jimmy is one of the presidents. Um, for a yearbook club, they are taking, they were taking spring sports pictures this past week and they're finishing up taking submissions for seniors who committed to play a competitive sport in college. Broadcasting has been doing an amazing job trying to go to as many games as they can each week to film spring sports. It's really appreciated by all the players. Uh, Stop the Stigma is looking for help from the student body to film a short video to spread awareness on dealing with mental health. And Portuguese Club, uh, it's a brand new club and is having their first meeting on April 7th. Also, this is just an update that we hadn't included because we actually discussed it today, but we are having a uh, spirit day on April 26th. It's going to be where teal and white because teal is the color for sexual assault awareness month, which is this month. And we wanted to also show a video during homeroom, which we are still working out, but that's just something that's in the works. For academics, students are working to finish up their individual slash small group service projects. And we are continuing to submit hours monthly. New members, the juniors are in the process of applying and just or just submitted their applications. Um, for honor societies, applications have been released for those eligible for memberships and those are due Friday. Science National Honor Society also working with the juniors uh, to get the selection process done and we're having monthly meetings with speakers. And then Social Service Honor Society has been having a teen for genes drive. Um, and it will be going through Friday. Students, faculty, and community members are encouraged to donate slightly used jeans of any size and style, as long as they're not ripped. And then Tri-M is having multiple chamber members uh, sing the national anthem for various spring sports senior nights. And then lastly, uh, Elise Karanian, which she is one of the uh, Stuco officers and Sam Cotrera were selected as the 2021-2022 CASCIAC Scholar Athletes. They will be honored on May 22nd at an awards ceremony with other student athletes 
across the state as the alpha tool. And I believe that is everything. Excellent, thank you very much. Do we have questions or comments from the board members? Ms. Weaver? Great update as always, guys. And Jimmy, just gonna say the legacy of a student council president puts you right back here. So just gonna say, but great job guys, thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? We'll thank the two of you for your report tonight. Very informative. We appreciate it very much. With that done, we are going to move on to agenda item E. Oh. I did want to give a shout out to Fadisha because she posted where she's going to school. So congratulations on making your decision. Good. And while you were talking, we have a hand up that I just noticed. So Miss Yap. Hi, thank you, Fadisha. Um, for your presentation. I just had one question. Um, do we do anything for Autism Awareness Month since April is Autism Awareness Month? Uh, I was actually not aware of that, but I will definitely be bringing that up during homeroom tomorrow with the other student council officers. Um, one of the, our friends and also a student council member brought the um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month uh, the information about it to us because it's something very close to her heart and I can definitely look into the Autism Awareness Month. Thank you for letting us know. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Any comments from you? Good. You're good, all right. So we're gonna move on to agenda item E and first up is going to be the presentation on the community service project from Martin Kellogg. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Lambert, principal of Martin Kellogg, and he is joined by Mr. Duran. I believe there may be some other Martin Kellogg staff on the line that I'll let Mr. Lambert uh, introduce, but they are gonna talk to us about some pretty exciting community service projects. Mr. Lambert, the floor is yours. Absolutely, thank you everybody for the uh, opportunity uh, to talk a little bit about tonight about our KFC projects. And that is not to be convinced, uh, mixed up with anything having to do with the kernel or buckets or anything like that. KFC stands for Kellogg for Community. And uh, our Kellogg for Community team convened in 2018. And the intent behind it was to do further promote a sense of unique and then by grade level progressively um, unique identities at each grade level. And uh, the team consisted representation um, from each grade level, encore staff, support staff. Um, and we really spent some time, you know, grappling with the following questions. And this was kind of simultaneously as the district as a whole was developing their portrait of a graduate. And they began that um, sort of that foundational work. And essentially what we did is we asked ourselves, what does it mean to be a grade five student at Martin Kellogg Middle School? That's unique to being a grade six student, seventh student, et cetera. And what does it look like? And what does it expect? You know, when we say we have these pillars of respect, responsibility, integrity, and pride in our school, how does that play out? And how does that become alive um, in our school? So we spent um, several uh, time in meetings together talking a little bit about what that was going to look like. Now, truth be told, I, I when we first started this work and um, you know, I wanted to be respectful of the committee's time because this was voluntary and also what we were setting up you know, to ensure it was going to be manageable. Um, and in fact, the outcome was the complete opposite. I found myself having to rein staff in because there was so much excitement about the uh, opportunities to do reach out work and, and how that's going to play out in our school as we sort of developed identity at each grade level. So collectively, the team agreed that each grade level should have a pillar attached to it, you know, respecting grade five, responsibility in grade six. And we should be tying learning opportunities. And at that time, we called them pillars or pride days to support this work. So it would be like lessons around what does it mean to be respectful in your school with each other in the community on the ball field. And uh, we built that up over time uh, through a series of lessons that we would have that would kind of would eventually turn into our advisory period that we utilize today. We also wanted to see it. We wanted to see what the different um, 
identities in the grade level look like? You know, so then we we did that through a variety of means. For example, we have grade level T-shirts. So if you're in seventh grade at Martin Kellogg Middle School, you would have a gold. A t every student's um, given a gold T-shirt. And they all have the number seven on the back and then the pillar that's associated uh, with that. And we did that. And all of a sudden, things like our pep rallies and, um, you know, a lot of our special spirit days and things like that really began, began to come alive because not only were students made to feel part of sort of a collective whole around the pillars, but they had a unique identity attached to a specific grade level that reflected them and things that they were representing. And then finally, and this was the, the larger lift, the team uh, committed to supporting service learning projects um, aligned to each pillar. And this would allow um, grade levels to self-select community service project, which has you know, kind of evolved over time. And I'm joined by two of our staff members, Mrs. Laura Speranza, uh, who is one of our school counselors, and Mr. Jeff Jacksina, who is a grade seven social studies teacher, who are going to share some of the projects that we've done and also kind of talk a little bit about how it's uh, developed. And more importantly, with our upper grades, it also involves student leadership, you know, so as students kind of move through the grades, you know, we wanted to create opportunities for them to assume mentorship um, opportunities that involves just kind of supporting the, fifth, you know, the lower grades to sort of rise to the expectation in the pillar, but also actually physically participating and supporting and lead helping to lead the community service projects. So we really wanted to bolster student leadership. So I'm going to pass it along to uh, Ms. Laura Speranza, who's going to talk about what some of the community service projects and what they look like. Hi, everyone. I, I assume you can hear me. Yep. Awesome. So um, thanks for having us tonight. We're really excited to share some of the things that our students have been working on. Um, I'm just going to share with you the fifth grade and the sixth grade um, service learning projects. So our fifth grade students are working on their projects this week, actually. Um, they've been drafting their designs and they'll be painting their rocks um, with positive messages. So you can see the pictures on the screen are just from previous um, years where they were working on their projects. Um, I did promise not to share too much and give away any, uh, any secret information, but I can share um, that this year they're going to be gifting their creations to members of the Kellogg community to show appreciation for their leadership. Um, for their positive contributions to the school community, and also to kind of wish them well on the next um, adventure, if you will, as they move forward. Um, like Mr. Lambert said, we always look for opportunities for our older students to kind of take a leadership role. So with the fifth grade rock painting that's going on this week, um, our seventh grade student council and student advisory will be supporting um, Mrs. Pedagorski, our art teacher, um, and our fifth grade teachers and students in, in their you know, fun creative project that they're working on this week. So that's kind of the fifth grade. Um, as for sixth grade, you can see um, they're doing some bookmarks over there. Um, with the Battle of the Books, you know, being one of the anticipated events of the sixth grade year, they really wanted to continue their focus on books and reading. And so for their service project, They've been creating bookmarks to give to the elementary school media centers, and then those will be shared out to the students during book checkout and things. Um, the sixth graders have been working on these for, for weeks now, and I was able to talk with several of our sixth graders, and they all agreed that the project you know, was really important. Um, they shared that it allows them to be creative and to make a difference at the same time. One of the students um, said that her sister is actually in fourth grade at one of our feeder elementary schools and um, can't wait for the bookmarks to show up at her elementary school so that she can get one. Um, I think she's hoping to get one that her sister made, but um, we'll see how that goes. So she, um, another student kind of gave me a smile and admitted that um, she still had the bookmark that she received when she was in elementary school that one of the sixth graders had made um, and that she actually was currently using it in her book to save her place. Um, so it means a lot, not only to the students that are 
creating the bookmarks, but also to those that, you know, that are receiving them. Um, I did, you know, I told them that I was coming here tonight to share all of their really great work with the board um, and ask them if there was anything else that they wanted me to share. And they said, and I quote, the younger kids look up to us as role models. And if it comes from someone older, it's cool. And that makes reading cool too. So we did a really great thing. Um, and I guess I couldn't have said it any better than, than what the sixth graders shared with me. So we are, the, we're really proud of the work that they're doing. Laura, thank you very, very much. And thank you for doing a good job maintaining the confidentiality on where the <laughs> friendship rocks are going to land. Historically, we we sent that we, we a few years back, we actually created a rock walk um, that was for our incoming fourth graders. When they visited Kellogg, we actually created a rock walk for them that kind of led them to the front door of the school. And on their way out, they could grab um, a rock that had a keepsake with our pillars with nice messages on it. For some reason, the elementary principals were just concerned about us giving all the fourth graders a bunch of rocks to take home with them. I don't know, you know, I, I guess they, uh, they, they were a little concerned about it, but it was, uh, it was well received nonetheless. Um, in talking about the seventh and eighth grade projects, um, I, Jeff Jackson was gracious enough to join us and talk a little bit about his experiences. So I'm going to pass it along to Jeff. Hello, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I just wanted to build off of what Mr. Lambert said earlier in, in his comments and, and what seventh and eighth grade is trying to do is create kind of a, a lasting memory of their experiences at seventh and eighth grade. Um, and at seventh grade, I'm gonna talk about that first. Uh, what we've got involved in is the Iron Giraffe Challenge. And what we've done is we've tried to, to connect our curriculum um, to civic engagement. And this year we, you know, we really got um, really involved in it where last year during the pandemic, we connected the long walk to water and we started to raise funds um, for the, the Iron Draft Challenge and the Water for South Sudan, um, which is to provide wells in South Sudan, which is connected to our, our human rights curriculum and our curriculum with East Africa. And last year, <clears throat> our students raised $1,000, um, which was enough money to donate, I, I believe, uh, at least to build a well in South South Sudan. This year, um, our students raised an additional $700. Um, and in addition to that, as you can see in the new the, the feature in the Newington Life, we also gathered um, hygiene products to bring to donate to human services at Newington Town Hall. Um, so we were really excited this year to be able to um, give our students an experience um, and really connect to kind of civic engagement and, and helping the community out uh, through this, this project this year. In addition to that, we also tapped into some parents and they were able to read a long walk to water. Some great uh, parents were able to read a long walk to water and kind of get a feel for what their, their students were doing or the kids are doing in the classroom. So that was a great, um, a great project that, that we did. This is our second year doing it, and we, we hope to continue that project in the next coming years and tie it to the curriculum. I'm also going to present on the eighth grade project, which is also something that we've been doing at Marine Kellogg for a long period of time. I used to um, teach in eighth grade. I taught both seventh and eighth grade at one, social studies at one point. Uh, and one of the things that we've always done in, to try to support uh, the community service is the Veterans Day uh, program. So for years, and you can see Hank uh, Stefanowitz used to come to Newington Public Schools. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with him, uh, but he was a veteran and Silver Star um, a recipient um, for his service uh, during the Vietnam War. He would come and speak to our students about his experiences on Veterans Day or prior to Veterans Day when, when we had it off. Um, in the past years, what students have done in conjunction with the service project is to create letters to veterans. Um, and it's kind of run by the eighth grade social studies teacher, uh, Jordan Jarvis and Scott Gray, but it becomes a whole uh, grade level thing with all the, with all the teachers. Last year uh, during COVID, because Hank wasn't in this year, because Hank wasn't able to come in and speak, the um, Newington Sports Veterans Wall was brought to Martin Kellogg. And all students within the building were able to go and look at the wall and look at service members 
um, from Newington who have fought in the different wars. And it's really to pay tribute um, and to focus on appreciation and understanding what our U.S. service members have given up um, for our freedoms and support our country. And what they do with these letters is on Veterans Day, they write the letters uh, prompted by the teachers. And then the letters are delivered to the VA hospital, to veteran, to, to members of the VA, VA hospital. And it's typically met with uh, great admiration and, and very, um, you know, warm hearts, you know, coming from students. The students really get engaged and ask questions and really enjoy being able to kind of give back and connect um, with, with those veterans. So it's a great experience. All right. Now with that, um, you know, what we really look, look forward to is the opportunity for the students to have a hand in how their learning comes alive. You know, we always look to, you know, provide authentic learning experiences for our students and for them to number one, have a voice in how they want to see their learning extended and, uh, and decide that amongst their grade levels and for students to have, um, you know, a hand in that, you know, really does, we we're finding it makes an impact. And every year, the community service projects just have a lot more energy and enthusiasm around it. And as they continue to evolve, you know, we're excited. We have a, a great group of staff members that are highly invested in it. And we really appreciate the opportunity to, um, you know, to share this with you. You have hard work ahead of you, you know, as we're coming into, you know, the throes of budget season. And we're so thankful that we can have the opportunity to share some of the fruits of your labor, you know. And so thank you very much for the opportunity to showcase um, one of the really nice features at Martin Kellogg Middle School. And we wish you the best of luck um, as you uh, endorse everything good teaching and learning. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to open it up for board questions or comments. Go ahead, Ms. Hyde Wagner. Um, I was just going to say this is this is very inspiring, um, especially um, uh, I read the book um, Long Walk to Water with my students as well. Um, and I actually printed out or carried in the newspaper article and I showed my students um, what the kids in Newington were doing with that. And they, and my students were excited about that and brought um, some cans of food into school. And we kind of started a little food bank. So I just wanted to use that example to show you these little, these little acts that they, that may seem particular to Martin Kellogg are spreading, um, which I think was the whole point and purpose. And so there's just really, really good things going on and it's just continuing to happen. And I love that the students have a voice in what they're doing. I think that's just preparing them to be um, well-rounded citizens of this world. And that's that's really what we need right now. So thank you so much for this presentation and, and thank you to the staff of Martin Kellogg um, for facilitating um, these amazing projects. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Um, I think I just wanna thank, um, thank you for the presentation and you know, uh, uh, it's really inspiring. So thanks and uh, Keep doing a good job. Ms. Weaver. Um, yeah, I just want to comment. Uh, I was actually cleaning out my room, uh, my childhood bedroom this weekend, and I found my um, like wristband that said, we used to get wristbands that said all of the four pillars of Martin Kellogg, and it was respect, responsibility, integrity, and pride. And I just want to commend um, Mr. Lambert, Mr. Jaxina, uh, and, and the entire team for, for embodying that, because I think it's more than just a wristband. We, we talked about it and there, there are so many touch points, but I think putting it into a community service project um, is just really incredible. And to have every grade level involved at a different aspect, I've always endorsed those pillars. And I remember going into the CAF and they would be up on the, on the, on the ceiling. Um, and those were something that, that always stuck with me, but I think it's really great to instill um, further by actionable items. So um, one, thanks for sharing. And we look forward to hearing more um, in the coming years about these pillars, because I think they embody not just Martin Kellogg students, but every Newington Public School student. Very good, thank you. And Ms. Parati. Thank you. Um, yeah, my daughter goes to Martin Kellogg and we're cleaning out her dresser drawer and she had her fifth grade t-shirt and it was not something that we could get rid of. So, you know, she's gonna probably have a collection of four. So she's very excited about that. And um, thank you to thank you for sharing um, 
you know, as, as the students progress through the school, the projects get, you know, bigger and bigger. And, um, and the, you know, even the seventh and eighth grade students get leadership opportunities. I think it's wonderful. Um, and yeah, thank you for sharing. Cause we don't always as parents hear, you know, what goes on in the school and they're, um, um, sorry, blinking on the, the special days that they have. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you for sharing it and bringing that to the public. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, we're going to move on to agenda item E2, which is our health benefits fund performance. Dr. Brummett. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. I, I do want to just make a quick remark, a little off script, um, because I do want to acknowledge all of our speakers tonight um, as we delve into budget items later on. Don't know if you'll be staying, but um, I want folks, if you do not stay for the rest of the meeting, to know that we value our library program very deeply and we don't think it can be replaced by um, volunteers, although I value our volunteers as well. Um, and at no time is that the plan. And uh, rest assured when this budget season started, we were given a very, um, very tight outlook on how the budget had to look. And our goal was to not lay off existing staff. And by no means is any position being reduced by attrition a sign of its lack of value. That, that couldn't be further from the truth. All right, my deviation is over. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Lou Giacomowitz. He did prepare for the board um, a memo that outlined kind of a longitudinal history of the health benefit fund. Um, and the board did get a presentation about that uh, earlier on in our budget landscaping presentation that occurred back, I believe, in December or January. So um, I would just request that Mr. Giacomoz provide just a brief overview of, of the health benefit fund, and, um, and then we'll go forward with the rest of our agenda. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the report you have in front of you summarizes health benefit activities through the end of February of this year. And so it's in a um, forecasting scenario, it's eight months actual, four months estimated. The formula system that is built into the health benefit agreement addresses how that formula actually works to derive the calculation of what the estimate is for consideration as of April 8th. Okay. Uh, the rules of the health benefit agreement allow the board to advance, uh, decide uh, on uh, any credit dollars that are available under the presumption there may be significant initiatives that need to occur. Uh, the timing of advanced payments to ensure something is in place for the start of the next school year and just the general activities to uh, that would be in the best interest of the school district. These items are all factored into the decision-making that's there. The caveat that goes with it is that any money that is advanced taken in April, uh, you're on the hook for in case things go bad for the rest of the year. So if the board made a decision that they wanted to take $100,000 of what's available through the estimate, uh, they are on the hook to replenish that if the credit evaporates between now and the end of the year. So there's always been a, a conservative stance taken by the board and by the recommendations because the volatility can be significant. You know, as an example, last year, the estimate that was provided at March was just under $1.6 million of available funds. That ended up being 701,000 at the end. So it, you know, $900,000, was the reduction between uh, the end of March and the end of June. And the responsibility for the board to ensure they don't put themselves in deficit spending, funding, um, excuse me, deficit, deficit spending position, you know, is one that we all take very seriously. So in the times we have done an advance by, uh, we would be monitoring that right down to the last day to make sure there was no risk of a significant negative event happening. Okay. Uh, just as an aside, in this particular report, um, the original number I was estimating just a few days before this report came out was right around zero. And um, either the day before or two days before uh, we received the memo from the finance department downstairs about 
what they calculated the credit to be. Uh, $445,000 of credits were processed by Anthem for the benefit of the Board of Ed between the, uh, uh, excuse me, all the uh, drug rebates as well as stop loss recoveries that were uh, received. So my, I'm going to Dr. Bromit's office a few days beforehand and saying, I'm recommending a zero because I thought I think it's going to be, well, things changed in a two day time period. And it was obviously to our benefit, but it just illustrates the volatility that could happen uh, based on uh, the timing of real people's health events coupled with the processing of when Anthem puts everything through and when it actually is received back by the town. So in the situation we're in, it's great to be sitting in a positive position. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, it shows the plan is making sound decisions on uh, the risk that the town is willing to take with the uh, uh, levels of funding that are decided on. And it puts everybody in a position where there is uh, no you know, unpleasant uh, decisions that have to be made at this time. So many times we just... Uh, recommend is at this time to let the money roll over, see what's actually there in September and address it uh, all during next year's budget. And that's basically the position we're in. Now, we are not uh, proposing any motion at this time and one does not have to be taken at this time because of the rules. If no action is taken by the board, it automatically rolls into next year for the calculation. So there is no, uh, concern that's there because of the uh, item that's further along on the uh, memo regarding the memo memorandum of understanding it is tied to the same dollar amount that is on this uh, health benefit credit uh, uh, calculation but it is not associated with it so as you get to that later there are two distinct uh, financial events so uh, with that I accept any questions that anybody has or inquiries Ms. Yop. I have two questions, um, one for Dr. Brummett and one for Lou, um, if that's okay, Dr. Fletcher. Go ahead. First question for Dr. Brummett. Um, I keep hearing people um, speak about eliminating the um, media specialists. I thought when we agreed with the early retirement and we were going to save money, um, we couldn't use that to maybe keep them employed. I mean, is that an option? Um, my second question was for Lou. I heard you, um, you were saying something about, you know, right now we're in the positive, um, in regards to, um, you know, the health savings, seeing that, you know, with the curriculum and different things, they may have other needs that come up, such as we haven't decided, Desmos and other things. Don't you think we should be a little bit more frugal with our spending and focus on like the primary needs of the students? as opposed to like, you know, some other secondary, you know, wants <laughs> we may have, you know, essentially just focusing on ensuring everyone stays employed, especially during the pandemic, ensuring that the students get the, you know, the software and supplies that they need before we try to, you know, maybe take on additional projects. When in just a general response to that, uh, the major component of this is we're talking about activities that are associated with two different fiscal years. We have actions and decisions that need to be done uh, for the benefit of how we finalize our this year's appropriation that are made in the next month to two to be rolled out and fulfilled sometime between now and June 30th. The budgetary decisions as far as uh, what to save, what to uh, trade off for the various uh, resources the board wants to put in place for next year is a decision that the board will make. So if that a media center position is truly desired to be reinstated, we have to provide a offset in a similar amount of money in order to uh, provide the opportunity to put that back in. It's certainly, it's absolutely within the board prerogative to do that uh, and making the prudent decisions. We would have to obviously examine how to go about doing it. At this point, with the uh, actions that were taken previously to get the board down to the 3.63, that position uh, with the retirement uh, only had a continuing value of about 54000 which would have been the replacement, the estimated replacement costs 
for that position. Uh, if we would uh, want to restore that, we would need to set aside at least $54,000 for that particular uh, request and find the savings elsewhere in the budget next year to do that. So in trying to guide the board for good decisions, it's always a matter, is this decision reflective and impacting on the current fiscal year, or is it a budgetary matter for the succeeding fiscal year? And you aren't necessarily able to cross over on those. I'm not sure that answered the question, but that's try to provide a framework. So I believe Lou covered quite a bit of this in his remarks, but it, to just reiterate, we, the board, determined when we've got the money for the Arab credits, which turned out to be about $150,000, that was applied to reduce the budget. That is how we got to, or part of the reason how we got to the 3.63. So, and now the board is faced with further cuts. So restoring positions at this time, as Lou mentioned, would require us to revisit the budget and look at where, where things come and where things go. But as the board is aware, not only are we not looking at a 3.63% increase, we're looking at uh, quite a bit less than that after the um, what we're hearing from dialogue from the town. So again, we calculated in all the ARIP proceeds into our uh, budget offsets. And similarly, the board was made aware of a retiring library science teacher uh, who, who was leaving through attrition if they were not replaced, there would be some savings to the budget and that was an agreed upon board decision. Should that be reverted, we would have to figure out where that money's coming from. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions related to the health benefits performance? Ms. Weaver. Okay, so I just wanna clarify it because I think it was a, a prominent point that you made about last year's in terms of, just so I'm, I'm clear and the board's clear, Last year, there was the 1.6 million between March and what were the months where we were it was reduced by 900,000? Correct. The March 20, March 20th calculation estimate that we received from mm -hmm. the town last year was 1,579,000 and okay. something else. By the time all the claims came in, all the adjustments and the settlement, that claim or that value diminished to $701,490. So, and we typically don't have quite that much volatility, but if you can recall last year in the spring, the pandemic lifted a little mm -hmm. bit, the, you know, we're back in school, a lot more activity in the general community. Uh, it appeared that more people were just going to the doctor regularly instead of just staying away and with some semblance of return to normal. Uh, there's also the skewing of the uh, reimbursements in the plan because of being a high deductible plan that in the early part of the year, you're paying the claims out of your deductible. The plan's not paying for it, the participants are. So once the deductibles get met, all plan expenses are paid by the plan. So uh, as an example, I just did a quick look at this 12 month cycle. For the uh, eight months from July of 2021 through February of uh, 22, the average claims are 625,000. Looking at the last four months of last year, it averaged seven hundred fifty-six thousand dollars. So it was one hundred thirty thousand dollars more a month on average of the claims. Now that's not all attributable to um, just the bias of the plan, but it, that's definitely some of it. You know, I think the activity level was up a lot. Plus, we know we're going to be spending probably a hundred thousand dollars more a month those last four months just for paying claims that are just routine in nature without anything else other than that's the plan design. So uh, that combination of keeping a symbol calling 50-50 of uh, the bias of the plan and the uh, much more vibrant use of the plan over that same time just brought the credit down. There was no uh, wild, uh, huge claim that impacted it because we do have those stop loss insurances to protect the plan, both for the town and the board, uh, from significant negative adverse events. Okay, so I guess my question, like with that line, and I guess this isn't not an exact art or science, whatever, but in terms of <laughs> much, <laughs> um, just kind of looking at, we saw that huge spike in Omicron, and we're are we anticipating that delay might impact these next few months again. 
It, it could. I don't think okay. the, uh, the, level the doctor it. visits, the prescriptions that were there, it's the hospitalizations, it, yep. major surgeries, uh, and the long-term element of some of the recoveries for people that would impact it. Okay. But the um, basic somebody being kind of shut down for 10 days, two weeks just to recover wouldn't really be a big driver of cost in the plan. Okay. I guess my question was just like, <laughs> are we going to be in the same position as last year? I don't think to the extent, and I think you would agree maybe, but. Right. I think the credit number will go down okay. from here, uh, but I don't think it'll be as significant, but it's very easy to prove me wrong. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. So just for clarification, the health benefits, they run concurrently with our fiscal year? Correct. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Ms. Perani. Is the estimate of 476,000, does that include future? So like that's what, it's not at 476 today, or is it? I guess I'm wondering. I don't know is, exactly where it's today. <clears throat> As of the end of February, the formula that's in the health benefits agreement calls for the formula to be calculated in a certain way. To okay. That way there's not variability every year in opinion that's associated. It's very structured for the formula. So the 476 is not actuals. It's an it's estimated an estimate. of okay. what we think it'll be or what the formula thinks okay. it'll be when all the counting is finished in September. Thank you. It's all projected. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Seeing no more questions, we are going to move on to agenda item E3. So Dr. Brummett's going to review with us uh, some of the recommended adjustments to the May and June 2022 calendar. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. This is uh, somewhat of a continuation from our last meeting. I did follow up with the board via email regarding um, what the process was for determining those three days um, reverting to half days at the high school, why they couldn't be postponed. There is some senior events later in that week. Going earlier would give the teachers less time to review. So I was reassured by Principal Tigno that these are very, um, these days have been well thought out and um, the staff had given a due diligence and consideration to make sure it would work well for the faculty. Just a reminder, there was a question about if a junior and a senior in the same class what happens on that exam day and that there is some teacher discretion there that if the majority of the class is seniors, the juniors would take the exam early. Um, if the majority of the class is uh, juniors, they might take it at a separate time and the seniors would have a modified exam. So again, uh, my recommendation is that we uh, do change those three days, this May 27, May 31, and June 1 to early release days to facilitate senior exams. So we have actually two separate motions here. So I want to work on the first one. So before we open it up for any uh, discussion or questions, I would like somebody to read the motion. Move the Board of Education change Friday, May 27th, 2022, Tuesday, May 31st, 2022, and Wednesday, June 1st, 2022, as early release days, in parentheses, 12, 20 p.m., for Newington High School only to allow for senior exams. All right, motion is made. Second. Seconded by Ms. Hudwagner. It's open now for discussion. Anybody have questions or comments? Ms. Drozd? Um, I, I, I appreciate the response in the email because then I can process earlier and I don't process this great at this time of evening. However, I did have one person reach out to me who is very concerned because they already have um, a family event planned down in Maryland and they have a senior. And they want to just reassure that if their child, and it said it in your email, but I just want to make sure that it is like out there and known to every teacher that if a child already has plans and they miss their finals, that there is no consequence to them. I can assure you that that will not, they will not have a consequence, then they can reschedule their exam. Very good. Anyone else? Mr. Laverriere? Uh, yes. And did we settle on... Um for sure, allowing the juniors to be in mixed classes that allow the juniors to get the same uh, rescheduling there, right? Yes, if, if the class is a split of juniors and seniors, the teacher may then decide to give the one final exam to the entire class at the same time. However, the teacher would also have the discretion if she wanted the juniors to have a little bit more instruction, she could, uh, he or she could give them a separate exam a week down the road. 
So it is, there is some flexibility there and the students would be notified by their teacher how that would sort for those classes that are junior and senior classes. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Ms. Yop? My apologies, my hand should be down. Okay, thank you. Ms. Weaver? Uh, just one more thing. I think we confirmed the last meeting, but kind of after. Um, this is also because uh, like the timing, it's allowing for makeup. So I guess to address Ms. Drode's point, but I think Wendy may confirm, but this was to give enough time for makeups as well as that's correct. That's that was stated okay. in the email. Okay. Yeah, that's okay, been perfect. clarified. Just wanted to clarify with everyone. If we Thank did you. it any later, then they wouldn't have time, time for, for the makeup. Yep. Sorry for answering for you. You're good. You got it right. All right. I don't see any more hands, so there are no more questions. So I'm going to call the question. If the clerk would please call the roll. Yes. 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 Very good. Thank you very much. And now uh, we have one more recommended motion related to the school calendar. If somebody would please read the motion. Move the Board of Education change Wednesday, June 8th, 2022, Thursday, June 9th, 2022, and Friday, June 10th, 2022, as early release days, 1.35 p.m., for Anna Reynolds School only, to allow teachers to have the ability to pack due to the upcoming construction. Motion is made. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Weaver. It's open for discussion or questions. Ms. Rose? I'm going to ask a mom. I, I, my only concern with this is how is that going to impact parents and, and daycare and will like three days in a row, is it two days in a row, three days in a row, like would that hurt their daycare situation? Would they, that's my only concern. I did call Necky, spoke to the director um, and she can make an adjustment to have Necky start earlier on those three days. And um, so those parents will have that resource extended earlier in the day. And once now we're going to make this public, if the board does approve it this evening, then Mr. Smith can alert the rest of the families to make sure they can have ample time to make arrangements. But for sure, NECI will run on those three days. Thank you. Ms. Parati? Um, yeah, I just do want to point out that Mr. Smith did mention it at our PTO meeting last night. Um, and I think everybody is very excited to get the construction underway. So anything that we can do as parents to help with that process is, um, yes, is happy. And my daughter is at NECI and she's super excited to be able to spend all that time with her friends who are in her class. Well said. Okay, anyone else? All right, I am going to call the question if the clerk would call the roll. Yes. Danielle Drove. Yes. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Yes. Beth Yes. Richard Laverrier. Yes. Amy Parati. Yes. Sam Sharma. Yes. Yes. Anastasia. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving on, we're going to go to item E4. So Dr. Brummett is going to review the calendar survey results and discuss her recommendations for us to review uh, regarding the 2022-2023 school calendar. Thank you again, Dr. Fletcher. Just as a quick background, uh, the board last fall took up, or actually last spring as well, took up some discussion about including more holidays in our calendar in keeping with our equity vision and mission for the district. And I wanna point out that a young man in our audience tonight, Mr. Habib uh, was put forward his student voice last year when he was in Anna Reynolds school as a fourth grader requesting specifically Eid Al Fitter be part of our school calendar. Uh, he came to the board and presented a compelling reason for that. And from there, we had other holidays come up as a result of the genesis of that 
young man's um, advocacy for his culture and holiday. And we had speakers to talk to us about Diwali, as well as uh, consideration by the board to also add Three Kings Day so that all of our cultural um, communities are represented in our school calendar. The board deliberated about that and it was determined that a survey would go out. And from there, I'd like to share those survey results um, with the board. I will tell you that the survey um, was still open. So I did double check it today to make sure none of these results would have changed as a result of some um, later respondents and it did not. So based on our folks, and this was not just holidays that we were talking about with start dates and such. So I'll go through this briefly. We um, wanted to post to the board or the community rather, whether folks would rather start later than our typical August 25th, which is for next year's calendar as it currently sits, uh, would that be, would the community prefer August 31st? And while it was somewhat close, there was still a desire to leave the August 25th start date for students next year. And again, this came out from a teacher council meeting where some staff were saying, you know, we would prefer to have a different start date to align better with our children's calendars. And, um, you know, so we did want to make sure we were looking at multiple voices. And as you can see at the top, there were 732 responses and a few more came in uh, this week. Oh, okay, that's, they relate to the game. So, cause that one should have gone out quite a while ago. The, uh, then there was the question about adding the holidays. The board felt very um, strongly about making sure all of those holidays were added. So there wouldn't be any type of parceling out of one holiday over the other. And based on that, again, we're considering Diwali, Three Kings Day and Eid Al Fitter. And this again is for next year's calendar. That would add uh, October 24th next year as a holiday and January 6th. Eid Al Fitter falls on a Saturday next year, so it wouldn't affect next year's calendar, but the following year it would. There was a pretty strong majority, about a 10% majority would like those holidays added. Then we asked the popular the uh, population in town as to changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, as many communities in our neighbors our neighbor neighboring communities are doing as again part of their equity efforts, and it does align with our equity efforts. And that was a very strong response of more than sixty percent of our population wanted to change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Then we asked certified staff. Um, don't know if only certified staff responded to this, but we wanted to know if they were um, of inclined to, if we have some of these holidays added, would they be comfortable with adding a professional development day into one of those holidays? Um, the response there was no by about a 10%, about an 8% margin. What we didn't put in the survey is if you celebrate those holidays and you didn't want to have to give that up now that you finally got it into the school calendar, you would be allowed to take a personal day. We did not include that in the in the write-up of the survey, but I'll rest assured that would happen if, if the calendar is approved to maybe put one of those in as a PD day. And then the board was concerned about, um, would this affect daycare? And the very small majority of the parents, about 23%, have said yes, it would have some impact on daycare. Uh, more than 75% of our population said no, it had, they either said no, no impact, or it doesn't apply to me because I don't have daycare needs. And then um, I will say this last question created confusion and I got a lot of calls about it. And I know the board had directed um, me, if I recall correctly, not to have people have a choice of, I wanna get out early and scrap the holidays. So we carefully, didn't ask the question that way, which created an interesting result because the this, this indicates that folks would rather, uh, if we look at the majority, which was a pretty small majority, that leave the calendar, do draft calendar number one, which is a late start and add the holidays, which was interesting to me because earlier in the survey, they said they wanted to relieve it as an earlier start. So that's a bit of a disconnect, but you know, surveys are only meant to give us some guidance. The board ultimately 
gets to make the decision about school calendars. That is one of your functions to set school calendars on an annual basis. So now we're back to, um, you know, where do we go from here? Based on the survey results and obviously some of the, the uh, discussions I've had with staff along the way, I am recommending that we adopt, um, it was originally called draft two, which would start school on August 25th, which would make our tentative last day, June 9th. It would add in the Diwali holiday and the Three Kings holiday for next year. And then in subsequent years, we would also add Eid al Fitr. It would also keep all the other existing holidays in place. But we put a little twist in there for you just to make things interesting. We discussed about election day is often a difficult day to have PD because there's voting going on. On occasion, there's been some complaints about parking. So we are recommending that um, election day becomes a non-school day for everyone except uh, you know, office professionals and administrators, and that we do our second PD day on the same day as Three Kings Day. Now, again, the question in the survey indicated that maybe people had trepidation about that, but if an individual employee does celebrate Three Kings Day, they could still have that off as a personal day or temporary leave day. So those were the two big changes, adding the holidays in, I'll go back to the motion so it's in words, that's a little easier for me than pictures. Um, the recommendation is add the three holidays, eventually, two next year, one the subsequent year, then make November 8th a non-school day for students, but offices and administrators would be uh, obviously on duty, and G January 6th would be a PD day. Um, I also, we also made adjustments to, on January 6th, it's followed by a PL Tuesday, like the next week. We thought that was too much to have parents have a PD day in January and then a PL day the next Tuesday. So we're making that next Tuesday a full day. So I don't know if that's clear. I'll put the calendar up that I'm recommending and people can, I'll turn it over to Dr. Fletcher for questions. So what we will do is, um will allow questions for clarification. And then once uh, this is all clarified, then we'll read the motion and then we can further discuss it. Any questions for clarification? Uh, Ms. Yop. So I just wanted to be clear. So you're saying that if we, if we start on August 25th, our last day would be June 9th. I just wanted to make sure that was. That's what correct, barring any snow days. Okay. And if we, I don't know if I can ask this, if we started on the 31st, what would our last day be? 13th. Yeah, 13th. June 13th, I think. Later. Yes. 14th, I believe, is what it was. Yes. So August 31st would mean we the last day is the 14th and uh, August 25th would mean the 9th. And the August 31st would include all holidays, correct? Yes, that is one potential version, yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Ms. Weaver. Just to clarify, the survey went out to both parents and staff. Okay. Well, We're not. <laughs> I mean, just for clarification, I know that you said that a couple came in over the last 24 hours because the high school parents just got it. Um, so do you, and maybe this is part of the discussion and I can table this, but do you predict that, it, that the high school, that's 1,200 students, you know, the 10 parents that are going to do it, but do you think that that would push that, could it change the data? It did not actually peak before I came today, not even realizing the high school sent it out late and the end result was the same. Okay. All right, no more questions for clarification. Um, I'm gonna ask for somebody to re uh, read the recommended motion, Ms. Hutt-Wagner. Move the Newington Board of Education amend the 2022-2023 school calendar to reflect an August 25th, 2022 start date and added holidays, 
change November 8th, 2022 from a PD day to schools closed slash offices open and make January 6th, 2023 as a PD day. No school for students slash offices open as recommended by the superintendent of schools. All right, the motion is made. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Branda. All right, now we'll open it for discussion. Ms. Parati. When I looked at the last question, I know there's three different options, but if you take into consideration the percentage of people that chose the early start, it's the majority. And then the added holidays, it is also the majority. So early start is yellow and blue and added holidays is red and yellow. So that's how I looked at it. And therefore, that's why I think that this is the best option. Anyone else, Mr. Brenda? I don't know if I'll get a chance to do this, but um, so when you came to the meeting last year, there was only myself, Jessica, Dr. Fletcher and Beth, and you talked about your sibling needing to, to, you know, worry about studying and a test and had to sacrifice, you know, essentially a holiday, a belief in order to come to school. And when you read your letter, I remember our, we were on Zoom, but like everybody was just kind of just the, the all, everything came out of that room, out of that Zoom room, because we were just like, wow, like nobody was thinking about that. And then you came to our meeting and you opened our eyes to something that, quite honestly, was never on my radar. And after you presented, I I jumped through so many hoops to try and get connections uh, with people to talk about Diwali because I started to look into things because of you. And I I want you to know that you, it sounds to me like this is going to pass. And that's a huge thing. Like you changed the town of Newington, just by presenting a letter. And so you're in fourth grade or fifth grade? Okay, so, you know, a lot of us ran on the Board of Education, knocked on doors, say, we want to change the town, we want to do all these great things. You showed up, you read a letter, and you changed the entire town. So you should be proud. You should be proud as well. Thank you. And to Ms. Droz as well. When we had that holiday discussion, we weren't talking about Three Kings Day. We weren't talking about it. And I, yeah. I'm serious though. I think, you know, we were, we were all in a different space and I think you created that you helped open our eyes. You helped us think differently. And I just, I wanted to say that to you. I didn't know you were here until Dr. Brummett said it. So thank you. Thank you for standing up to uh, this entire board and making us aware of something that was important to you. And I'm just really happy that this is, I think going to go through. So thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Drozd. I, I just want to say, yeah, let's give you a round of applause. Yeah, I'm gonna like I'm gonna I'm gonna ride on your coattails a little bit. So I wasn't on the board, and um, I just want to say like I work in a district that talks about like everyone and welcoming everyone, and I sit here with like great pride being part of this. Going like like we're not just talking the talk, like we're actually walking it. And uh, thank you, thank you for bringing it up. So um, again, you know, we only see things from our own eyes so often. So um, you know, keep this in mind that you know you it's it's all of the young people's jobs to to make us see things differently. So thank you, that's awesome. Like totally awesome. All right, thank you. Ms. Weaver. Um, yeah, I just wanna echo that. Um, thank you, I got like goosebumps and like wanna cry all at the same time. This is like, um, but yeah, I, I wanna thank Danielle as well because um, yeah, I think, you know, we were, <laughs> she was like, let's just add another one. Cause you know what? I know kids that celebrate this too. Exactly. Yeah. But I think it was one of those things that that opened up. And I think it's one of those things like we as a, a board don't necessarily get the opportunity or haven't had that opportunity to, to uh, or consider that opportunity to, to do this. So I'm really grateful for that and, and to be a part of this and to have that kind of a discussion because I think even though you think you know everything, you don't. So um, it, it's really great. But uh, the other thing I wanted to just touch on too was um, we had considered last time talking about this too, like Veterans Day as well. But I wanted to point out, I talked at length with Mr. Brando about this and other colleagues. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where we're like, oh, do we want to get something off? Do we deserve, you know, obviously veteran, we have a veteran on our board. Um, but like one of those things, and I think I just go back to Mr. Jacksina's point tonight, 
of um, having kids learn about it in school. And we went back and forth, like, is it better to have kids in school to learn about this? Um, so, you know, just like one of the things to let the public know, we do consider all of these things. And like, if we could, every day would be a holiday, like national every day, right? And so I think what we want to do with with this in particular is to be able to recognize and, and give a point to these holidays, to be able to talk to them and make that a point in the classroom. Um, to Ms. Joe's point, you know, we're able to, to welcome everyone in, but then also have these points of why do we have this day off or, you know, to, to have a religious observance, right? So I think it's really important because growing up, I didn't, we didn't talk about this. You know, it was something we talked about a lot of my friends in college after, and they're like, yeah, we, we didn't have this. But um, I think it's just one of those things where th these are going to be points of conversation to have that only make your community better. So I'm really in support of this. Um, I also think it's great in terms of the election day thing uh, to be able to, to have that. Um, <laughs> I think um, all of us are pretty pro voting here. So uh, <laughs> we want to make this as easy as possible for teachers as well. Um, so that's just a, a great consideration. And I'll just close by saying, um, I just appreciate Dr. Fletcher for taking this up. Um, but looking at it from the perspective that, you know, this is a, a, we have to be inclusive of all of our opinions here, right? So um, that's why I think we all called for this survey. And of course, we're going to get response bias and, you know, we won't get as many as we want, but I really appreciate everyone who took the time to take that survey because it's helpful for us to inform that. When I saw that there was like three all at like 25, 30%, I was like, oh my God, my head's going to explode. No way. No, like everyone's split. But I think it's helpful to say, you know, if I'm going to vote on something, I want to say, you know, the majority did, did want this, right? Over the majority wants this based on our survey results. So not just what we're hearing from you know, speakers and what we want. I think, you know, my decision is also informed by our community. So thank you for those who took the survey that's informing our decision. And um, it looks like that that's a majority of who wants also the early start date, early start date. So thank you. We used to say to the students, you'll thank us in June. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Branda. Really quick because um, also Vidisha, shared some um, important perspective uh, with Diwali and I just wanted to thank her and also Mr. Desai who came and, and presented to the board and and also former Chair Vasella. You know, I think he obviously, um, he kind of set things up to have the Diwali presentation. Um, I worked with him and it's funny, I was calling all these people and I, I think I got like a food service person and like that's the trail that how we got to Mr. Desai. Um, so, it, you know, it was a collaboration between so many different people different perspectives all coming together for the same, you know, end result. So I'm just really happy that we've gotten to this point and I'm very excited for this vote. So I won't talk anymore. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no more hands raised, uh, I'm going to call the question and I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. Absolutely. Yep. Dr. Bruce Definitely. <laughs> Yes. Richard yes. Amy Sarani. Yes. Sam Sharma. Yes. Ethical Weaver. Yes. Absolutely yes. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Job well done. Don't forget to run for the Board of Education when you're old enough. All right, we are moving on to our last agenda item. Uh, it's number five, it's E5 in your packet. This is a discussion and possible action tonight uh, concerning the 2022-2023 budget memorandum of understanding. Uh, would you like to? Okay, I'll, I'll share. Wonderful. Um, I absolutely uh, would like to thank Dr. Fletcher because uh, we had a conversation and he reached out to the mayor as, again, just to be clear with the board, those were preliminary conversations. Tonight is the night where the board has full input. But, um, you know, we came to understand that we, the town and the board seem to be on the same page about not wanting any layoffs. However, the 1.69 that was uh, the town manager proposal would not get us there. And so we approached the town, I should say Dr. Fletcher did, with how can we get that money reinstated to at least make us whole with all of our salaries. And um, 
with some back and forth, it was determined that in order for the mill rate to be lower, which is a big goal for many folks on the town side, um, which I certainly don't disagree with. I, however, I, I do wish we did have a more full allocation, but nevertheless, we um, came to an understanding that if the board could set aside the 476,600, the town would then be willing to restore that money so that we would not have to have any further reduction in force. So that would put us at a 2.46% increase next year. The timing of it's important. If the town does not get the money before the end of this fiscal year, then it would impact the mill rate. If they get the money after that, again, the mill rate would, would be going up and it wouldn't meet their goals. I know that many of you are saying to yourself, where is this money coming from? So right now we are looking at the budget Carefully, we've had a pretty strong budget freeze in play this year because we were in a deficit spending model most of the year. Um, in fact, I know there was a question earlier this evening that does the board get access to our current balances? That was provided at last, well, at last week's board meeting, um, and we were provided on a monthly basis. And uh, one board member reached out and said, "My goodness, there's a lot of negatives," and that is true. When you have a, that was Miss Rose, of course, she's on a roll again this week. <laughs> She, she wondered, rightly so, how in the heck are we going to get through all these negatives? And again, the board is aware that we had planned to use some of our non-lapsing monies to get through this year because we had a 0% increase and we didn't want to lay off staff last year. So that money is still being determined as to how much we need to use. The budget freeze did serve its purpose and we are using less of it than we thought. We estimate and again, as you heard tonight earlier, estimation is where we're at right now, that between one and $1.5 million of that non-lapsing money will be used. And the board needs to keep in mind as well that we have also planned to use 1.2 million of that non-lapsing money in next year's budget as part of our effort to produce a lower budget this year. So we, and that one, between one and 1.5 million takes into account that we would use some of that money to send this money along to the town before January, June 30th, rather. So at the end of the day, what's the best case scenario? The best case scenario is we got the 3.63%. I wouldn't have library science teachers here upset about a position reduced. Um, but unfortunately, those, you know, we didn't get everything we wanted this year. So this is the next best thing. Um, it keeps us whole with other staff. We're not laying people off. Um, we are going to have to make some adjustments. Even if this goes through, the board will then be tasked at our next meeting with kind of reconciling the entire budget uh, after the town makes their official determination. I will also say, and this is a very important point, um, the reason we're less worried about the health benefit credit and uh, frankly, I've been here only three years. The health benefit credit's kind of been a political football where we get kind of hit over the head with it in the fall or we're getting this windfall. The board's got this deal that's not fair. We were really relying on that money every fall to pay for buses and technology because up until this budget season, I can show you the 10-year history. We got very little bus money and very little technology money. If it were not for this credit, we would have been in very dire straits with both those items. So while it was seen by some as a windfall or some sort of pulling magic uh, money out of a hat, it was actually just money that we came to count on because of the fact that we were not getting proper funding and capital. That is no longer the case. This capital budget funds us in buses, funds us in technology, and we are gonna get quite a bit of roof money this summer and actually in April to begin a roof replacement project at the high school of a substantial uh, amount. So we are, you know, capital wise in very good shape, which makes the health benefit credit less of a stressor. You know, I'll put my pitch in now. The health benefit MOU is a huge asset. It keeps our rates uh, reasonable. And if this type of arrangement helps with us being able to uh, look at that Funding that we get, if we, if it continues, as you know, this can be a very volatile item. You know, is this something we can look at down the road as as a way of offsetting budgets? I don't know, but for now, I would recommend 
that the board uh, approve this MOU. And that would allow us to then officially forward it to the town for their approval. Uh, I'll let Dr. Fletcher speak further about his conversations and where this all came from. Okay. All right. So originally we made one proposal to the town. I, I did it to the mayor and they came back with their counter proposal. But their counter proposal allows for us to be able to not do any uh, layoffs, but at the same time, it keeps the mill rate where it's at so that the taxpayers win. So in essence, it is a win-win for both the Board of Education and for the taxpayers of Newington. While it doesn't get us where we were projecting that we wanted to be, it is better than what the original offer on the table was. After working through this draft, uh, it was reviewed by both the town attorney and attorney Mooney that represents the Board of Education. Both of them gave a thumbs up. They said that it was fine. So it reached their approval. Also, I wanna take a moment right now publicly to thank the mayor for her willingness to negotiate with me and to talk about this. And we were able to put politics aside and we looked at what was best for the school. And she was very favorable for doing this for us. Um, I don't know how it'll go in the vote, but I pretty much feel that it's going to pass there as well. So I was prepared to come in tonight and just to share with you the draft to give you the information about that. Uh, we would have to have a special meeting, which would have to be held on a Monday night on the 18th in order to approve this because they have to vote on it on the 19th. Uh, but if it is the board's desire, not mine, but if it is the board's desire, we can discuss this and possibly take action on it tonight. I know that there are a few people that are in favor of doing that. So sure, let's do a motion. I like motion. Can I make it up? You can you make it up as you go. It'll be recorded. We move, I move. I move the Board of Ed move to pass the memorandum of understanding that is proposed by the town council dated 2022-2023. That's good. That's good. Second that. <laughs> All right, so the motion is made and seconded. Do we have any further discussion? Mr. Branda. So this is not in any way to diminish the work that I know that, that you had to do to get this done. I hate the fact that we have to do this though. Um, I, I believe that there is a lot of misinformation about the funds that this school district has and how they use it. Um, I heard the, mon the statement that we have a stash even tonight. Um, I, I don't know where I, I'd love to see that stash um, because for the last few years, we've been dealing with the same things um, where we're just not really funding this school district in the way that we have. We have people here that came here passionately pleading um, for, you know, a retirement to be filled and we just can't do it. And I, I think that that is, that's just a sad state of affairs for this town. Um, I think overall, when you know we're sitting here doing the budget for as long as it took, that doesn't take into account how long Dr. Brummett and her team spend on the budget. That doesn't take into account how long all of the buildings take and all the departments take to make their request. And then to see our budget get essentially cut within days of all of that work. Last year, it happened before we even submitted our budget. I think the system is broken. I think that this budget process has to be fixed. I'm sorry to put it on you, Dr. Fletcher, but you're sitting there. So I'm asking for your help for this next budget process because I believe we have town council reps that are assigned to this board that are supposed to be attending our meetings. And I think it would be great if perhaps during the town council meetings, they are reporting out on what they're hearing during our budget deliberations, because often I hear 
that we don't go through the budget. And I've been sitting here now for five years. You have, a lot of us have sat here for several years and that is not true. We ask a lot of questions. Ms. Droz asks a little bit more. <laughs> um, but to say that, you know, we're not leaving any stone unturned, I just, it's just not true. Like we are going through those books very thoroughly. So I understand why we're doing this now. I'm going to vote for it because I know what the alternative is, but I just want to say, I hate it. I hate how we constantly have to fight just to give our students and our educators what they need in order to be successful. And I hope that next year something can change. I hope that we put elections aside and thoughts of what we're going to campaign on aside and we start to work together and understand that Dr. Brummett and the town manager need to work together. And quite frankly, and I'm going to say it, I don't think that that problem's on our side. So I'm asking the town council to maybe, you know, request that their employee works a little bit more collaboratively with this board because it's not happening. And I think if it did happen and there were honest conversations happening at the table, I think things would be very differently. And I don't know why that those conversations don't happen, but they need to start. Thanks. I think I, I will make a, a comment on that. Um, I am working to try to bridge the gap that you're talking about and making progress in that. And I look forward to doing everything that I can possible. Okay, uh, you can go first, Ms. Hud Wagner. Since you're the uh, co-chair, the uh, vice chair. <laughs> I just promoted her. Not up <laughs> I'm going to walk out. <laughs> Yikes. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to say on record, I know I've, I've asked in a few different settings, but um, formally on record, a request that before we enter budget season next year, there be a meeting of the two bodies, the board of education and the town council to get on the same page. There seems to be a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of misinformation. There seems to be a lack of trust. And I think all of those things need to be put on the table, hashed out, whatever needs to happen, happen so that we can fix this process. Because I, I do think it's broken. I'm not sure where, and I think there's a lot of players, but I think we need to come together as, as two bodies to really move forward. So I just want to make sure it's on the record. But thank you, Wagner, asking for that. Thank you. And I'll let you know that I'm already looking for a marriage counselor. <laughs> you guys don't get that one. <laughs> Bring them in. Go ahead. Ready. So first of all, I just want to state that I got a lot of props for the questions that I asked. She said they were good questions. So, all right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I so I understand and I do. I I I I'm an educator. I would love a magic wand to get whatever I want, right? And and then but there's also the reality of that we have broken confines. And I do think we need to keep and remember that we are now getting funds allocated that we weren't in the past. So we're getting like a technology fund, we're getting a busing fund. So, you know, that was one of my concerns when we were doing the original budget. We had to keep that in mind that we were asking the taxpayers for that. So I, I, I don't know where the give and take is, but, um, and I do have some ideas on our library media specialist. So maybe when this all comes back to us, I can bring it up. I know that's not the time, but um, like this conversation, I would have loved to have had before we put the budget forward. Like I would have loved to have heard, heard from all of you because right because I don't ever like I like my media specialist he's a great guy but I teach math in the middle school like uh, but to hear it from elementary like I wouldn't have thought about that just like the holidays so it that kind of stuff would I would love to have heard like ahead of time but I have some ideas so don't give up hope yet. All right, thank you, Miss Weaver. Um, yeah, I I just want to to echo I think the sentiments here also yeah Jen, that was a good question i gave you props i gave you props a while ago. um uh but i i think um you know one of the frustrations i've had being on the board for just a bit is um you know i kept coming back to this point during our budget process was we got a zero percent the only one in our dirt to get a zero percent during a year of pandemic and i think there's a lot of 
talk about, you know, we need to support our teachers. We need to support our schools and blah, 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 especially during a pandemic. We need to help our students. And it just goes against that thesis. Um, it's really the antithesis when we're saying no. And I think one of the things I always look at in the budget, I said, how much are salaries and how much is everything else, right? And the majority of our increases are always contractual obligations to a salaries for the people, Right. And so I think a lot gets lost in translation and in social media, which is why I don't like that. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of us here, I mean, I, I enjoy working with this board because I do think we're all here with our earnest perspective to say that we really do want that. We want to be able to fund fully. Um, and, I, and we do go through this. We don't just, you know, I'm not sitting here going, you know what? everyone gets everything flat fund or, or, you know, magically everyone gets it automatic funding. I don't even have to look at it. We do all go through this budget process. And, you know, me as a former student, all of us as former students, teachers and parents, we all have different perspectives and that's the point of this. So I agree with Mr. Brandon. I don't want to be in this position. I hate being in this position. It just feels like we're, we're fighting to prove ourselves that we're worth it. We're that our students are worth it. And that's not an uphill battle you want to be on. You want to be on the same level of saying everything's worth it. And this is where, you know, we can make those small cuts everywhere. Um, I guess <laughs> my one thing about this, and I, I want to, again, uh, thank Dr. Fletcher for your leadership because it is recognized um, because you're not in the easy position. And I appreciate you putting those politics over um, because I know your commitment to the school system, not only as your personal, but now as the board chair. Um, so I want to thank you for that. In terms of this MOU, um, I guess my question too is if we don't have that, seven or four, seven, six, or what that number at the end, what happens? I would say that this deal would not work out. However, uh, you know, Lou and I have discussed this at length and we've looked at projections. I do believe through what we are seeing with the non-lapsing money, we should be in a position to send this money back to the town. Okay. And just get off my bully pulpit. I just want to say too, like, I, I think good budgeting practices is to be able to set yourself up for the next year. That's just responsible budgeting. And we're talking about financial literacy. <laughs> Doing these one-offs is not responsible budgeting. And I think that's just something we should be looking at and talking again. I, I appreciate Ms. Huckbanger's uh, idea. Um, and I think it's one of those things. Responsible budgeting is making sure that you're not only good for now, but you're good for later. And this is irresponsible budgeting by doing that. I agree that this is what we're kind of what we have to do. And I appreciate those efforts to do that. So please do not, you know, think that, that that's not um, the sentiment I have, but I, I just think it's one of those things where I'm not only worried about this year, but I'm worried about the next two years, the next five years, where we're looking at the portrait of the graduate in 15 years, because ultimately I, you know, I've said this before when I was running, like, I do think that the true economic vitality of our town is tied to our school system. I think that's what attracts everyone here. You always ask a family, why do they move to Newington? They usually say it's because of the school system. And so for me, I want to be able to prove that by saying, you know, we are, we are invested in our, in our school system. So I just wanted to, to thank you for your time, uh, Dr. Fletcher, but you know, this is not, I think, responsible budgeting. And I hope that in the next year um, we come to a, a more responsible act of budgeting. All right, thank you. Mr. Sharma. I just have, I just have a question for Dr. Plummet and maybe for Lou. So this, this 476, that's based on a projection, right? So that's not like, that may change. It may go up or down. Yes, that's correct. Um, but I, that amount of money is not even going to be received by the board till the fall. And it may, as we've discussed, be lower. We have to plan for that money now in order for this deal to work out. And we have we have made that plan and projection that we will have the money uh, prior to June 30th. And can you would, would you know would you know like how much money the board learned that gave back last June or maybe the year before? Was it do you know how much money was left over or you know when you did when you do the books on June 30th? Last year we did have, um, it's in one of my previous presentations, I believe we were able to have a residual of 500000 Lou? Correct. Last year was 500000 of a general surplus. We had a give back on the excess cost grant. Mm -hmm. And there was one other element that I can't remember what that part was. That wasn't, wasn't a tremendous amount of money. 
Then we return a lot of that back to the town. Okay. We you did. It, we've before? had a we previous year it was about 1.5 million or 1.4 million. Uh, we did have above average residuals those two right. years because of COVID. Uh, we will not have that this year. More likely than not, this money will be coming out of non-lapsing. Um, again, as everyone said around the table, not ideal, but it does beat laying off staff. So, so, um, so the 1.5 million, the 500,000 that the board gave back to the town. So, I mean, it's, so that money just went back to the town. It's not like in a bank account. It's not hidden. It's not stashed. It just went back to the town, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is not stashed anywhere uh, by statute. Any unused funds at the end of a year need to go back to the town. Uh, okay. We are allowed to send 1% back to a non-lapsing fund, uh, which we have done in the last two years, which is why we have money there. But uh, anything not accounted for by June 30th automatically goes back to the town, and that's a requirement. We're not allowed to carry that money over or stash it. So the so the state law actually allows you to you to keep like two percent of what one percent. Uh, state says yeah. up to two, but right. the town would have to agree to that. I did ask for that a couple of years ago. They said no, but at least we've got the one percent. It's at least an opportunity, but um, but I believe some districts probably have the two percent ability, which is allowed by law. But one percent is what our town has agreed to. So if the, if, the, if, the, if the town allows, we could actually keep up to 2% instead of 1%. They could they could approve that thus far. They have not. They approve 1% thus far. All right. I mean, it have to I be mean, an ordinance. I mean, I understand the budget. I mean, it's just like, I don't agree with that, this money being like, you know, sent, give whatever, I mean, given back to the town. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's just like we, you know, we cannot have any layoffs and, you know, um, so, I mean, I, I understand what Dr. Fletcher, you know, I want to thank him for like, you know, working out this sort of an agreement with the, with the town. Thanks. All right, you're welcome. Mr. Leverrier. I do. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fletcher. I do want to uh, agree in part with, uh, with Ms. Weaver that you know, not everybody in this room or nobody in this room really got everything that they wanted, but at the end of the day, um, we have no layoffs and we have, a decreased mill rate for the taxpayers in an age where there's 7% inflation and families struggling financially. No layoffs and keeping the mill rate low. I'm, I think that's a win-win, even though we didn't all get what we wanted. Thank you. Very good. Ms. Parati. Thank you. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. because um, <laughs> You're too young for that. <laughs> um, I don't like this. Um, I don't like that the numbers 476 based on the projection that we don't know that we're going to get in the fall or whenever that um, health benefit credit comes in. I appreciate you working with the town. I don't know what your initial proposal was. I'm sure it was more than what is here, but basically we're using our savings account to fund our next year's budget in addition to the 1.2 million that we're already using to fund the budget because of the shortfalls that we have. Um, the town does the same thing. I think two and a half million in the town is going into the budget. So I find it a little irresponsible that we're doing this or we're forced to do this. I will vote yes for it because I think we have to. I don't like it. Um, I was there yesterday at the public hearing. I spoke up. It was nerve wracking, just like now is. Um, <laughs> but I do think that we sh are we should be fully funded, or at least what we asked for. Well, more than this, yeah, <laughs> more than just what it takes to not lay off staff. I I know the people are the most important. Not everybody, you know. The hopefully we can figure something out. I'm looking forward to your great ideas. Um, you know. The kids are the most important. This will allow classroom sizes not to be too large. Just you've listed the things, Dr. Grama. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anastasia Yop. Um, I do have to agree with Ms. Oliveria. Um, I'm very happy that there are no teacher layoffs. I'm also very happy that we're going to be lowering the mill rate. Um, I know everyone doesn't think this is a win-win situation, but I 
I don't know. This is hard. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. It's, this is not an easy thing, but I, I do want to say, you know, I am happy no one's getting laid off and hopefully we can figure out the you know, whole media library situation and um, also make the townspeople happy that their, their taxes aren't going to go up. Um, yeah, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Further, Ms. Weaver. Okay, last thing, I'm sorry. No, um, I just, I also wanted to just acknowledge our speakers tonight because I think I kind of misunderstood too. Like I didn't, I thought we were good on the number of staff we had. So for me, it's like we're losing, it, it feels not like a layoff, but it feels like we're losing full force, right? Yeah. We are. So it's like, <laughs> to me, it, we're not winning at all. We're, we're losing. And so for me, I'm like, I'm looking at this, I'm like, can we put, 54,000 added to that on the MOU. Um, cause that's really like where I'm at. Um, it, it's just like, to me, I'm like, okay, we, we slash whatever, can we find somewhere else? And it, for me, it's just like, we're being told no, 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 no. And it, it's difficult because like Mr. Laveria said, like we're in record inflation. We have to budget for that. I don't see it going down. We're in stagflation. Like, let's get real. It's it's not going to go down. Um, I don't know when the Fed hikes are going to happen again. <laughs> and I, We're budgeting for that at this snapshot, right? And for me, it's just like, I feel like we keep saying no layoffs, but I feel like we're still losing. We're losing staff. Um, so for me, that that's just one thing I, I take issue with. And I think for me, I, I'm in support of this, but I want it to include that if that makes sense. I, you know, I think it's like, okay, we're looking at 592,000 in part of our brains. If we're not like, you know, doing our board hats and blah, blah, blah. Like you're like, there would be 54,000 in there for a teacher. To me, that's just common, not on, on my board hat, but that's really where I feel. So um, I don't know. I know we want to vote on this tonight and stuff, but I would love to go back to the town and be like, would you like to be able to, <laughs> to find that? Because to me, I think that's critical. I think the case was made already. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I just feel like we're giving mixed messages. We're saying we support teachers and we're saying we support all of this. And then we're like, uh, can't actually make funds for that. So for me, that's just one of the difficulties I'm trying to reconcile right now, because <laughs> we have this memorandum in front of us and the, we're not adjusting for everything. It feels like, it feels like we're not full if that makes sense. So I apologize. I'm just trying to actively put that out. Mr. Brando. So with this MOU, this sets our budget. It doesn't technically say, and maybe I'm just like fake lawyering this, but it doesn't technically say, because they, they're not voting on, when is the vote for the town budget? It's on the 19th. So if we came back and said, we approve this, you could still technically advocate for them to increase the budget. Like, it's not like this sets the budget is what I'm saying. I guess I get that it, it sets it to at least that, that total, but it doesn't say exactly that it's that and final. And, you know, to, to Ms. Weaver's point about us losing staff, it, I think it needs to be said that the town government side is adding staff in their budget. And so that is a concern is that, you know, again, you know, to Richard's point, you know, if we're just doing what we need to do due to inflation, but, you know, again, in partnership, one side is adding staff and has money in their budget for new staff and new functions, but we're not even able to fund a position that currently exists. And we just have to raise our hands and say, well, you know, tough luck for the education system, but town government's getting a three something percent increase and in new positions. So uh, again, I think I understand we may vote on it tonight. I'm just wondering now that Ms. Weaver has brought it up. I'm wondering if it's worth tabling and doing a special Zoom meeting on Monday to see if you can have a discussion with the mayor about this. But I don't know, unless this is like, this is our final offer and we're just at this point and we just have to figure out the numbers afterwards, but I think it's worth looking into. This is the best that I could negotiate. So waiting is only gonna prolong what's on here right now for the MOU. What if all these people go to a town council meeting? Well, I can't tell people <laughs> to do or not to do, but um, I mean, 
we can always ask if they could add more onto there. Uh, that's up to them. But this is an agreement that we have between us and with them to restore us back to at least the 2.46% so that we avoid layoffs. I mean, this is our agreement with them. What they decide in the town council meeting when they vote is totally up to them. And, and that, that's kind of what I'm saying is that this sets us at that point, but nothing really stops them. It's this sets our budget at that minimum. Technically, if the people behind me had a hundred something friends that showed up on Tuesday, April 19th and said to the town council, Hey, at 7 PM, it would be great if you actually threw in a little bit more funding so that we could replace a retirement. That's what I'm saying. And, and again, I think I said it, but just to be clear, I really appreciate your work on this. I know that this was probably a lot of back and forth and at times probably a struggle, but I appreciate the fact that when you sat in that chair on your first day, you said that the people that work here are your priority and the students are. So I understand that this MOU accomplishes that 99%. And I understand that that 1% is not your doing in any way. It was the best that you could do, but maybe April 19th, 7 p.m. town council meeting, tell your friends. Maybe if I added ice cream, you would give me 100%. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Hud Wagner, oh, Ms. Parati. I was, I was actually going to say the same thing, but you beat me to raising your hand. So I resorted to using Zoom. Um, and I do want to just, I'm not a lawyer, but um, it does say this re re will result in a final allocation of whatever, and it's 2.46%. So I know they can do whatever they want because they're the town council um, and they're deliberating and they they made no changes last night to the overall budget board or otherwise um, they made no changes either side um, the 19th is the absolute last time they will ever discuss deliberate whatever the the mill rate will be set that evening so I just you know whether we have to do something before that date so we can't really I would love to, to Ms. Weaver's point too, add 58,000 or whatever that um, that dollar amount was to this 592,000. Um, but if we vote on this either way, um, April 19th is the absolute last day at 7 p.m. in the town hall that they will be deliberating and talking about their budget and setting the mill rate for this year. Thank you. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you speak. Question. Yeah. Uh, whether we do it tonight or we wait until the 18th, we're still going to be voting on what's before us. So, you know, good question. Uh, your question. My question, question was if, oh, 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 yeah. if we vote on this tonight, um, I know um, you said that we still have to like reconcile it and decide kind of what goes where. Can we be creative in, in reallocating and looking at reinstating stating that 54, $54,000 or is that like a huge ask and are things so tight that it would be hard to move that around? Because I, I do want to move this forward, but I'm wondering if that 52, $54,000 can be worked out within what we have with, creativity. And I, I don't know. I don't know. I think that that is something that we can bring to the table to discuss in our April 20th meeting. Because I'd, I'd like to move forward with this here. I mean, that is a good thing to discuss. And thank you for bringing it up. And I, I will work on putting that on the agenda for discussion. Mr. Leverrier. It's already been made. Motions made and second. Uh, Anastasia, do you have another question? Because your hand is up. I do. Okay. I have okay. Questions. <laughs> Sorry. First question. Um, it's for Dr. Brummett. Um, and I don't know if um, I know that the town is now picking up the cost of the roof. Can we use any of the money that we originally had allocated for that towards maybe, you know, reinstating this media specialist, or is that just like not in the same fund? I would ask Lutafield that if you wouldn't mind. 
because I think it was one point five million dollars, which would definitely cover a media specialist. Because we're getting away from the motion oh. that's here now. So Anastasia, um, that is a very good question. We're going to carry that forward into our next board meeting uh, because we need to take a vote on this particular agenda item right now. Okay, because it does not necessarily pertain to this motion. While everything is good, what everybody is bringing up is excellent. It doesn't pertain to the motion on the table. So I need to bring us back into uh, focus here. So no question, sir. Um, just to Ms. Prati's point, so I just want to confirm with this MOU, we kind of lock in that 2.46. Is that correct? Because it's saying within that. So we don't actually increase anything on our end if we agree to this. Now, I'm just uh, understanding in terms of like if these terms don't come to fruition, I guess that's again, I asked this before, but I just want to clarify if these don't come to position, is this MOU completely void and do we have to make magic happen? I guess I'm just kind of, <laughs> I, I have faith in this. I do. And I appreciate that. I just kind of want to, my mindset is always prepare for the worst and that <laughs> just the kind read, of. The Reader's Digest version to your question is it does affect us if we don't have the money, but we won't know until the end of the school year. So if we don't have the money, then this MOU is not in effect. Okay. Okay. I'd just like to call to move the vote. Yes. Okay, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. Michael Branda. Unfortunately, yes. Yes. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Yes. 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 Ma'am Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Anastasia. Yes. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. I want to thank all of you for your efforts and the discussion on this particular topic tonight. At this time, we're moving on to agenda item F, which is public participation on any matter related to board responsibilities. If any member of the public chooses to participate, we do limit your time to three minutes. And it looks like we have Dana Havens. Hi. Um, okay, Mr. Branda, it was not a statement that there is a stash. It was a question as to where those funds went. Are they still there? And why all the account balances are shared and are not shared and included in the budget book that the Board of Ed is providing. Again, I have to ask you, if you're going to quote me, do so accurately. I do agree with you, however, that this system is broken. I don't feel the Board of Ed gets all the financial information you should be getting to make fully informed decision. The surprise to you, the, that to you, the board, not just you, um, that there were monies in the Chromebook insurance account is just one example. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, sir, please go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Amin Habib. Okay, so, um, so I remember one time I was just like, okay, I wrote this letter. Okay, I, wa I, wa I want this holiday. I'm like, this isn't gonna go anywhere, all right? Next thing I know, two days later, I get an invitation to a board meeting and I'm like, whoa, all right. And then a year later, I'm doing something again in a board meeting. Like an hour later, everybody's clapping. A minute later, I have just changed the school calendar. And, uh, um, and then I, I know there's gonna be this one person, I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna walk in and I'm just gonna be like, okay, I changed the school calendar. They're gonna be like, okay, wait, what? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And then um, also, I would just like to um, thank my uh, um, thank some of my teachers from um, my elementary school, like Mr. Smith, my principal, and Mrs. Merrick for like initiating idea. And I would like to thank Dr. Brummett and the board um, for uh, considering and accepting the request. So thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here in the room who wishes to speak at this time? Yeah. 
the the same hands are still up, so I'm assuming that they just didn't put their hands down on Zoom <clears throat> in the public. Okay, so at this time, are there any further comments from the board? Ms. Parati? Thank you for speaking. I'm, that was so cute. I'm just, I'm so proud of you and congratulations. And you should be so proud of yourself. Tell all your friends, you you did a great thing for the school district. And I'm so, I don't know, it's okay. Um, and again, Tuesday, I'll see you there. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I see no more hands up. Uh, oh yes, go ahead. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor say good night. Good night. Good night. Meeting is adjourned.